big, big welcome from my end as well. Um, I'm so incredibly excited to be here today. Um, it's just crazy just walking in the entrance and seeing so many friends, familiar faces, people that have been with us on this journey over the last 10 years. You know, there have been people here from the very beginning that were there even in prehistoric times, you know, before Unisocial you know, Social Business was founded, which is a long time ago. And then there are also, of course, some recent friends. Um, but it's just so fantastic to see you all here, particularly because we, of course, know what's going on in the world right now. I mean, the world is still reeling from COVID in many places, even though we're lucky that we're all in a room here together without masks on. We all know um, what has happened, of course, in the Ukraine and what kind of effects that ha this has globally in terms of a food price uh, crisis, inflation rising, etc. So there are really many reasons why we wouldn't want to celebrate here today. Um, but we're super grateful that you're all here to mark this very, very important moment for us um, that we've been working on over the last 10 years. Um, and of course, we, we, are, we wouldn't be the social business optimists that we all, all are and uh, that we um, have been over the last decade if we wouldn't want to use a good crisis for a new start. Um, and we felt that in these crises that we're all in right now, you need to have something that you can, hand ho that you can ha um, hold on to and something that gives you some hope that you're actually going to get out of it. Um, and that's one thing which is for me has been for the last decade social business, a super concrete tool to solve problems in a business way. And when the problem seems so big that they're insurmountable, we can start in a very concrete way. We know where we're going, but we have a concrete way to say, this is the problem I'm going to attack and I'm going to do it in a simple way, step by step. So that's really been uh, my remedy and all of our remedy of how we've been able to, um, you know, live along despite some of those issues that are here um, every day. So I want to welcome you and I know you're you've just all got uh, seated down, but I kind of thought like, you know, we, we want to warm up the crowd a little bit. So what I would love to start with is actually welcoming the various groups. The first thing that I'd actually love to do is a little exercise of like who actually came the furthest. So I'd love everyone to stand up that has traveled more than 10 hours to come here and celebrate with us today. Who's there? Who's traveled more than 10 hours? Okay. Okay. Wow. This is an international crowd. Exactly. Wow. Amazing. So I see, I see India, I see Bangladesh, I see Kenya, uh, I see Brazil, I see Colombia, more Colombia, et cetera, et cetera. So more, more Costa Rica, I mean, like all kinds of continents, Uganda over here. So fantastic. Thank you so much for being, US, I forgot US. I haven't seen you yet. Welcome. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Um, th this is quite, quite impressive. So who has traveled only five hours to get there? Still quite large. Who's, who traveled more than five? Okay, still quite a few. Okay, from the Netherlands, I see a couple of faces, definitely uh, from other places, uh, from Hungary. Okay, wonderful. Okay, next group, who has traveled? Oh, Vincent from Amsterdam, hi. <laughs> he came by train, obviously, <laughs> my son. <laughs> who has traveled less than one hour to get here? More the Berlin crowd, probably. Okay, woohoo, also to you, a big applause. <laughs> So these are, okay, these are the in-between groups. And what I'd love to do is now um, kind of another exercise. So who are all the social business entrepreneurs in the room? Can you get up? There we go, quite a few. We also, I know, woohoo. Team from Cerro from Colombia, DJE from Kenya, um, et cetera. And then we, of course, have many social business entrepreneurs online because we couldn't fly them all in here for this important event, but many of them are watching online. Um, then we'd love to, I'd love to have the corporate partners stand up that have been setting up social businesses or including them into their value chain. Come on, get up, corporate, corporate partners. I and I see IKEA, I see people from SAP, I see people from Fifco, um, many different places, Suez, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh yeah, you get up all, all the time. That's the best, Tiziana. Tiziana has a triple whammy, at least. <laughs> from Brazil, from corporate, and also an entrepreneur. So all of the, all of the you tick all the boxes. Um, then I'd love to actually ask our pro bono partners to stand up. The, the team from BCG and also from Freshfields that have been supporting us literally from the start. Uh, for free um, in, in doing our 
like doing our legal work, doing all of our strategic work. Please, Georg, you have to get up. And the piece, yeah, it's been, it's been very impressive. But without you, we literally wouldn't be here, or at least I would be in jail at this stage. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. And the BCG team, I, I can't see. I know that Doug was here, but I don't know. Maybe you're not here. Maybe you're slightly late, so no problem. Um, and then I would like to actually ask the YSB alumni. There's been so many volunteers, people that have been working and pouring their heart into our work. For those of you that are here, please get up and, um, and we want to applaud you. Holke, so you're also, I guess, an alumni at this stage. Volunteer alumni. I know there, I know we have many more signups, so many of them are probably also online, but these are a couple of people that have been here from the start. Um, and now I'd like to actually ask the team to get up, the YSB, the current team, please all get up so everyone sees you and knows who to speak to. These are the YSBers. Um, and I maybe want to just point out. Mauricio, our country director on the investment side in Brazil, Tulio in Brazil on the corporate side, Flora, I mean, you all know Flora by now. She's been writing you all many emails. <laughs> David, Joe, Lucy, I, you know what? I can't even mention all the names. Just wave so you can, can, can see them. But this is a, these are the guys that actually make it happen. And we didn't, weren't able to bring our whole team. Like many of the team members are obviously in country. We couldn't fly them all in, but we wanted to at least have one from every country here. So this is the YSB team. And they're the ones that are really rocking the show. And I'm so grateful to have you with me every single day. You're making all of this action happen. Um, I want to also say hi to everyone online. So I know we have a couple hundred people actually that signed up online. So hi to all of you. And sorry, we started slightly late for you, but we're there and uh, I hope you'll stay with us. Um, and finally, I want to um, thank my co-founders and welcome them. Um, so I want to thank you, Professor Yunus, um, on your fourth trip after two years and two months out of your apartment in Bangladesh. Thank you so much for being here. And also Sophie Eisenman, please stand up so everyone sees you. My original <laughs> co-founder at YSP. She's been my friend before we actually started working together. We studied abroad in Argentina. We spent a lot of years together. And then eventually we went on and said, let's do this crazy thing and found this company. And Professor Yunus was crazy enough to say yes to two like early 30s when he was in like already a senior person in his like seasoned 70 year old. He said yes to two crazy ladies to say, we're going to start this all together. So thank you so much for having the trust in us. And I'd also like to have Karen stand up, who literally joined us, I think, probably a month after we founded the first company. <laughs> so she's been there from the start also. Um, Karen, you've also been our partner in crime and making this happen and been with us until now and still on the board. So thank you so much for all the time and effort. And finally, I want to mention also a couple of other people that literally have been with us since the very start. Daniel, I think I've, uh, where I don't know where you are, you're by, by you know, doing the IT in a, such a humble way. I mean, he's been with us since the start. I've never worked with anyone that long. I've known him longer than my husband now, so that's scary. <laughs> so Daniel, um, RT has also been there right from the start, who set up everything in India originally. So RT and then Rogerio and a few others, um, Sylvain, that I just wanted to point out at the beginning. So as I mentioned, um, for me, it's an incredibly special day today. Um, it's now actually 14 years ago uh, that I came to a conference like this and I heard Professor Yunus speak and he talked about social business and uh, I was a management consultant, as many of you know, at that stage, just doing my little Excel sheets and he told the business, uh, the, he told the whole story of social business and I was just so blown away. It seemed so simple. Like, how do we use business to solve problems? And it was, for me, a complete game changer in that moment. Um, if you don't know already, he's pretty convincing. So you'll see when he speaks later. <laughs> but that was really the beginning that, that changed my life and has, has made me committed to this topic now, really, for more than a decade, actually exactly 14 years, we realized. And this is actually what I looked like on my very first trip to Bangladesh. So 
I know I look pretty much like 12, but um, I'm actually still, uh, these are all Grameen ladies, all borrowers of the Grameen Bank um, that are taking loans from the, from Grameen Bank, uh, nine, one of the few of the nine and a half million women that are doing that on a daily basis. Um, and um, it was incredible for me to meet them and see how Grameen Bank, one of the very first social businesses that Professor Yunus started, ch is changing their lives in every single day. This is also a nice memory pick, Sophie. I don't know if you remember us in the Freshfields office, by the way, Georg, um, already signing our documents. You're signing your life away, and we are, we as well in some ways. But we were clearly flabbergasted at that point that this was actually happening at this stage. So these were the humble beginnings. Um, but what have we really been doing now over the last 10 years? Um, I think we came, like, what, what did we want to achieve with Yunus Social Business? Professor Yunus had already proven in Bangladesh that social business can work and it can also work at scale. Because often people think, oh, social business, social enterprise, that's always something very small, it, you know, it's not important, et cetera. But he had shown that it is actually possible. And we said, seeing is believing. So we need to show this in many more places around the world. We need to demonstrate that this is actually possible everywhere. And we also need to demonstrate that this is not something that is done by a few crazy people, individual entrepreneurs, which is what we mean with a bottom-up approach, but it's also something that large corporations adopt and take seriously, and that's the top-down approach. And that's why we're, in some ways, we've become somewhat of a funny animal. We're on the one hand investing in companies, so that's one type of a business, and on the other hand, we're actually helping large corporations transform their whole business models in a, in a better way. And those are the two sides that we've really been working on now over these last 10 years, because we believe that only if we also get the big guys involved will we really transform the way the economy works. So that's been our approach now for over a decade. So where do we stand now? What have we actually achieved? These are the impact numbers of just our own portfolio. So we've been supporting over 2,000 social business entrepreneurs in growing their businesses and helping them through accelerator programs, et cetera. And then we've actually financed a small portfolio of only 60 companies. But that portfolio is quite rock and roll because they have been able to serve over 17 million people with essential products or services. So I'm talking about low income people that what I mean with essential uh, products or services are access to healthcare, education, clean drinking water. So the things that we all assume here in Berlin as completely normal in the countries that we work in, which includes India and um, East Africa and Latin America, that's not necessarily everything uh, normal every single day. The second number that I want to point out that, that I think is very impressive is that this portfolio of only 60 companies has actually created higher incomes for 1.3 million people. Not for them being all employed, but some of them are micro entrepreneurs, some of them are employed, um, um, others are yeah, growing their little shops. So this is, I find, a, um, an impressive number uh, that just such a small amount of companies can actually make such a difference. Um, and it shows you the power of what business can actually do when it puts its mind to it. I did also want to share a couple of the examples of the impact that we've created through the work that we've done with corporates. But that's something, you know, we take impact measurement very serious at, at YSB. And, and that's something that is for us much less uh, easy to control because, of course, like the corporates run those, uh, those, those, those programs and those uh, social businesses. But to give you a little bit of a flavor, at least, we said um, we've created 12 joint ventures with large corporations, so where we use their core business and we use our understanding of poverty to build new companies together. And we can talk about a couple of those examples in a second. We've run over 60 projects with some of these large companies like the SAPs, IKEAs, um, et cetera, of this world. And one program that we ran last year in partnership with the World Economic Forum um, was actually called the Unusual Pioneers where we had 15 corporate social entrepreneurs, and some of them are also here in the room. I see Gisela from Pivco. I see um, Benoit um, here from Suez um, as well. And these alone, these few companies have created social business initiatives within their corporates that are also just last year reaching 11 million people, just last year. So long story short, what I'm trying to say on this slide is we don't communicate the corporate part as our impact, but it is, of course, also we help these companies as well. And if you just get a couple of corporates behind this kind of an agenda, you can also create a massive impact in a short period of time. 
but all of these numbers are sometimes quite abstract. I mean, some number there, what is a million more or less, like it's very hard to really fathom and to actually really understand. So that's why when I was reflecting on what I was going to say today, I was actually thinking I should rather tell a couple of stories, a couple of concrete stories of impact that I've seen that have impressed me personally um, over these last 10 years. So I just want to tell you 10 highlights um, so you can feel a little bit with me um, what it actually feels like to actually meet these social businesses and to see them in real action. Actually, some of you that are here, I know, have actually been with us in the field. My hair is a little wishy-washy um, and have been in the field with us. And so you've actually seen it yourself. Okay. Better? Okay, perfect. I hope you can still hear me. Can you still hear me now? Is this better? No. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me talk about these concrete examples. The first one is a company that uh, you know we've had in our portfolio for a number of years. Um, they're called Impact Water. Uh, there, a, a young entrepreneur decided that uh, he wanted to solve the problem of lack of access uh, to clean drinking water um, in Uganda. Uh, and he said, look, clean drinking water, it's not, it's not rocket science, right? There are the systems that actually um, ensure that people can have clean drinking water. It works. It's something very basic. So he actually decided to take those systems, put them together, and actually sell those simple systems to schools uh, in Uganda. Uganda, as I said briefly, 9 million people don't have clean drinking water in a country of 40 million. So that's roughly a fourth. Um, and he now single-handedly is reaching already 14 million students with clean drinking water, not only in Uganda, and we also only helped him in Uganda, I should say, but he's expanded the same model now to Kenya and to Nigeria and has scaled this up massively. So I think one beautiful example of a company that you know just took a problem by its horns and has solved it. He's actually, by the way, repaid the loan and um, has left our portfolio just very recently. Um, so is on his own and, and profitable running, running ahead. The second one that I want to mention is Nutrivida uh, and uh, Gisela, the corporate social entrepreneur in this case, is actually in the room. I don't know if you want to, Gisela, can, uh, there, there she is back there. She's waving. Put your hand up so people can see you. This is an incredible story. Uh, so Gisela was inspired by the idea of social business. She had heard Yunus know, speak about it and said like, I wanna do this in my company. Um, and she said, how can I use my core business? Uh, it's a bottling company, company in this case um, to actually solve a problem. And she decided she wanted to solve the problem of malnutrition, which is also a very personal story and you can all speak to her as well. Um, and she's created products, including porridges, juices, um, and soups, um, just in a powdered format that are enriched with micronutrients and vitamins. And she, with her business, and it's been a struggle over the last 10 years, but she is, with her business, has been reaching over to two and a half, almost two and a half million people with these products and ensured that, you know, malnutrition is a problem that can so easily be solved. And she uh, is really on the way to, to doing exactly that within the company um, and now she's moving on and taking, taking her knowledge to another company, which is fantastic. Another example I wanna mention is Tugenda. Um, Tugenda was started by an entrepreneur also again in Uganda um, who said, I wanna attack the problem of youth unemployment. Again, Uganda is a country where the median age is roughly 15. 15, so one five, so like definitely a lot lower than in this room, <laughs> sorry to say, <laughs> including myself. Um, and it's a massive problem to have youth unemployment. Um, and you've, you, you see on the picture these motorcycles. These motorcycles are not just used to get from A to B. They're a transport for um, you know, your crops, uh, your, your auntie, your kids, whatever. If you move, you use that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a very important way to get uh, back and forth. Um, and um, this, this, uh, this entrepreneur has actually uh, created a company that leases motorcycles to um, young unemployed people and actually ensures um, that they don't normally, sorry, I should have explained the problem first. The problem is that normally people borrow these bikes from um, Boda landlords and they can hardly make end, ends meet by just driving around. 
but the model here is that you lease uh, this uh, border um, from uh, from the new company to Gender, and um, instead you only pay a very small amount of money to actually in leasing fee, and after 18 months the bike belongs to you. Doesn't sound as exciting, but has a massive impact. Um, over 20,000 people have actually already graduated uh, from this company. Um, and now uh, they still have a, an active portfolio of around about 25,000 people that are currently still leasing with them. And they've actually ensured that over 60 million of assets has been transferred to these uh, young entrepreneurs. So it's a, it's a very successful model. Also, they have just recently exited our portfolio because they're, they've outgrown us. They don't need us anymore and they can find financing other, uh, in other places. No, I, I need this. I need it. Thank you. Um, maybe another one that I want to mention because it's again a, a lovely corporate example. So it's a it's a corporate example that was also founded by a, a manager within Cofresco. I also see him running around here somewhere. And, and Cofresco is a company that you know does a lot of work also in the plastic space, um, including um, swirl um, gab garbage bags that I'm sure many of you have in your own homes. And he realized that, you know, plastics is maybe not the ideal business to be in, but at the same time, we're also stuck because that's our core business. So how do we move out? So they made the commitment to say, we want to be a fully circular company by 2025, but how are we actually going to do that? How are we going to start concretely? So also here, we created a new company together uh, called We Shoot Recycle um, together in India, where they decided that we would collect um, waste from Indian streets that would actually go to a small kind of uh, processing plant that we created together. And the pellets that come out of this uh, processing plant gets now is the input for the production of new plastic bags. So the plastic bags are not using new oil to create new plastic bags, but they're actually using recycled plastics, which is not still a 100% perfect solution, but it is the right step in the right direction. And in the meantime, it also ensures that, um, you know, a couple hundred people have much better incomes than before. Um, wanna, I want to tell another story. This is um, uh, Achila Enterprises, and it's a company that we actually just visited um, last week together, or like not last week, two, three weeks ago, time is flying, um, in, um, in, uh, in East Africa. And it's, it's a story where I actually want to tell the story of this entrepreneur, Ruth is her name, um, that she's an uneducated woman. Um, she never had the chance to actually get any proper education because she wasn't living in a you know remote village uh, or like a city out uh, which is around about eight hours away from Kampala so it's not like she had privilege and from that perspective decided now I want to help people she was the, someone herself who was poor and that didn't have a an easy story had kids at an early age and didn't really have enough to feed them and started a little bakery started a little restaurant and by that sort of made it um, eventually she started this business uh, where she sells to farmers inputs so fertilizer and, and also seeds for them to be able to have better uh, yields um, and then she buys the, uh, the, uh, the products back from the farmers processes it and then sells it on the market. Um, and this woman that herself has gone through the struggle and herself, you know, didn't have the education or anything like that, has now been able to help around about 9,000 um, other farmers to have a much, much higher income. So that's, for me, very impressive, you know, especially for me coming from so much more privilege to see that this is not a question uh, that you only think about uh, when you are in such a lucky position, but actually also when you're in the not so lucky position which I find fascinating. And I think particularly now we're all talking about the food crisis. This is an example um, where she's actually ensuring that you know, people can ma still make ends meet despite uh, prices going up. Um, I'll continue with another corporate story. I'm mixing always back and forth funds and, and the corporate side of things. SAP is also one of those companies that has been with us really pretty much from the start. Um, I remember starting with them when um, the earthquake happened in Haiti, um, and they said, oh, we have some CSR money that we can actually spend there. Um, and then I remember us sitting in Davos, Professor Yunus meeting the then CEO and saying, why don't we take that money and instead of, you know, just giving it away, let's build some social businesses there. And that's exactly how we how we started with SAP. Um, it started as a CSR initiative, and now social business is something that is much more also 
um, ingrained in other parts of the business. Um, so some other people here, I know Adair, you have a history at SAP. Um, she started a social entrepreneurship program at SAP uh, called One Billion Lives, which has been very successful. Um, also started a social procurement initiative there. And SAP has now made a commitment to say that 5% of their procurement spend is going to be coming from social businesses going forward. Um, so that's very impressive. Um, we just launched a report on this topic around social procurement in Davos last week, saying that trillions of dollars are anyway being spent on social procure on procurement. Let's buy from social businesses. That's a low hanging fruit. So another story how a company has really changed over time. I'm already at seven, so uh, no worries. We're, we're getting to an end here. But you know, after 10 years, there are just way too many stories. And I, I was sitting there this morning, which one should I kick out? But they're just all way too good stories. Um, so Povi, this is a company from Brazil, which I also uh, totally love. Um, they finance people that want to do vocational training. So they give them loans if people want to educate themselves further and you know get qualified for a job. And Povi is a, is a, it's a fintech in the end, um, and it's a relatively new company. It's only been around for three, four years or so max. And so at the beginning of COVID, they called our team in Brazil saying like, oh my God, I don't know. We, you know, we may have to talk about payment terms, et cetera. We're really not sure how this is gonna go because in COVID, everyone was of course insecure. How would their lives actually continue? And they didn't know, um, would people decide to invest in their future or would people hold off and just like stay back and decide not to invest in their future? Well, the good news is that uh, during COVID, people did decide to invest in their future and Povi's business, i.e. lending for people to get vocational training, grew over a thousand percent just alone in the first COVID year. Um, and they're now just in the last year have been able to give loans to 160,000 people in Brazil to ensure that they can have access to vocational training. So it's a fantastic story in my eyes. Um, I wanna also talk about another company, which I love. And I just earlier this year met the entrepreneur in Colombia. Um, it's a company um, called Eat Cloud, um, and they wanna solve the whole problem of food waste which obviously is a massive uh, contributor to climate change because you know, we waste, throw away so much food um, and that contributes significantly to climate change as well. So this entrepreneur who, by the way, is already a multiple successful entrepreneur and is a very incredible tech guy, basically said, how can I attack this problem? Um, and so he developed a software just to show you also the range of social business from ag all the way to like artificial intelligence. Um, and he actually created this, um, this company um, which uh, works together with large uh, supermarkets like Grupo Exito and others. Um, his software is integrated into their ERP system and their ERP system tells Eat Cloud, oh, this piece of salad is gonna be bad tomorrow. So why don't you take it and put it into your system? And then he has an algorithm that um, then offers the products that are still totally perfect and, and easily like wonderfully eatable, but, but not anymore according to local regulations edible. Um, he gives them to food banks and actually ensures that you know, thousands of people have um, a proper food that otherwise they wouldn't get. So this is Eat Cloud, and they've actually been, if I remember correctly, the uh, biggest avoider of food waste um, in Latin America last year. And it's a startup that's only been around for two years. So it's very impressive. Um, number nine, uh, Rangsutra. Again, another company that I mention often and that I love. Um, it's, a, it's a social business that employs a few thousand women, or not employs, but works with a few thousand individual women um, in, in India that are creating cushions, among other things, and other artisanal products. And they sell these, among others, to IKEA um, and, um, and ensure that these women actually can work from home and have proper incomes. Finally, um, I, wanna, I wanna end on another company that we just uh, visited in East Africa called Burn. Um, Burn, um, yeah, uh, produces and sells improved cook stoves. Um, they ensure that you know women that are cooking at home and families do not constantly inhale these terrible fumes. They also ensure that less wood and less charcoal is being used because they are very efficient cook stoves. And this company has ensured that over 7 million people now have these proper cook stoves at home and have significantly reduced the CO2 emissions that are happening during cooking. 
But why I'm mentioning this company is because they've actually become a, a model for manufacturing in Africa. Their processes are now so efficient that they can produce cook stoves in a more cost efficient way in Kenya with a lot of manual labor than one could produce the same thing in China, which I think is very impressive. They're really a model for manufacturing in Africa. So these were my 10 impact stories, uh, some of my 10 really favorite um, social businesses and projects that we've been working on. But of course, there are many more. And of course, I had to leave out many fantastic stories. But it shows you a little bit the breadth of what social business can be, anything from working with smallholder farmers in a very simple way, all the way through to advanced manufacturing, but still creating many jobs. Um, and, uh, and that just shows you the, the, the multitude and the creativity that we can all have to decide to use business to solve problems. Um, but I think I really want to reiterate the point that this has not been just the YSB team for sure. And I know this is a little bit of a platitude, but it is really true. And I want to make the point that we could have only done it with all of you as partners. All of you in the room here have been involved with us for, for these many years. And only with you, um, we were really able to achieve all of this that you've just seen. So I want to um, yeah, actually applaud you from my end <laughs> for what you guys have all been doing and send you a big, big thank you um, also on behalf of the whole YSB team. But I also again want to point out uh, that it, we couldn't have done it internally or I couldn't have done it internally if we didn't have this incredibly dedicated team uh, that has been with us over all these 10 years. And there are many more faces that we didn't actually manage just to squeeze onto that picture. But you guys are the ones that are really doing this. So again, big, big thank you to the YSB team. Um, and finally, I actually want to tell you what's going to happen today. So you have a little bit of an idea of, of what's coming. So I'm not rambling on the whole time. You will get a break in between. Um, so this was the beginning. Uh, I, in a second, will also hand over to my lovely co-founder, Professor Yunus, who's going to tell us about the next 10 years, rather than just what has happened so far. Um, and then we'll have a little Q&A on that. Um, we will then have a fascinating panel um, on the whole, whole topic of like, what is the role of corporations in all of this? Are they going to help us achieve a world of three zeros? Are they friends? Are they foe of social business? So we'll have that discussion. And with us will be Adair Fox Martin from Google um, and also Emmanuel Faber, um, former CEO of Danone, who's now um, chairing the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so that's going to be an exciting discussion. Then we will have a break. So I know you guys need to network because you're such an awesome group. And I hope that you'll all you know, come up with great ideas what you could be doing together. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, we will have a session with two of our fantastic entrepreneurs, CEO from Colombia and DGE from uh, Kenya, as well as our uh, country directors and our COO, Tom, talking about, you know, what it actually means to do social business on the ground, not just the fancy slides, but what are the real problems um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we want to uh, look ahead for the next decade and make a couple of announcements. So, and then the final, the most fun part comes as of six, we're planning to just have drinks, hang out and chat with each other. So that's the plan for today. Um, with that, Professor Yunus, I'd love to uh, um, ask you on stage. Again, you've been my inspiration for the last 14 years. You've been my friend, co-founder, mentor, etc. I mean, everyone here in the room knows him, obviously. He doesn't really need an introduction. The one thing that I do have to say every time, because I find it so crazy, I mean, you've won all these prizes, I think over a hundred, I don't even know how to count them. But the main one is still that you were a character on The Simpsons. <laughs> so <laughs> that says something. <laughs> yeah, I should have shown, I should have shown that yeah. picture, but I mean, that's your real claim to fame. So thank you so much. And he is also quite entertaining, similar to as on, <laughs> on Simpsons, we've laughed a lot. Thank you. thank you so much for being here. And I'm handing over to learn a bit more about the world of three zeros that you envisage. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and very congratulations. Much. Thank you. <laughs> congratulations to you. Well, my, my first duty is to congratulate Saskia, congratulate the team of Unis Social Business. So let's give a big applause for them. That's it. on the 10th anniversary.
And that's the reason I came all the way from Bangladesh. So I have to do it good. Give a big, big applause for that. And I was wondering when I will really start traveling. I used to literally live in the plane. So then suddenly this thing happened. I was in uh, Amsterdam attending a gala, big celebrations and so on. Uh, then in the evening, there was a big reception. All the top people in Amsterdam were invited in that reception. So one funny thing started, we don't know how it did. We're always using our elbow to instead of shaking hands. That was the first awareness about something coming. It's still not clear what it is all about. Then I came when uh, I was supposed to go to Italy for another conference there. And I heard that the, my flight has canceled. So again, I don't know what to do. I have to go back to Bangladesh. And someone said, a friend of mine said, why don't you come to Munich instead of going to Italy? Because you have one, one more day to catch your flight to Bangladesh. I said, okay. And I did went to, I did go to Munich and spend the day with the big conference and so on. And then went back. This was the 20th of March when I got back. And as I entered, and I remained imprisoned in my house since then. I never crossed the front door for two years and uh, two months. So that's the kind of length of time that spent in the house. So now that a little bit of ease in the situation in Bangladesh right now. Uh, so we have to talk about when should I start traveling because all these invitations keep coming and I'm saying, sorry, no, I'm not going anywhere. So when do I say yes? So while I was doing that, here is an invitation of the 10th anniversary. So I said, this is a good way to start. <laughs> the 10th anniversary. So that's the reason I made up my mind. My family members were not very happy about it. They still wanted to stay home. They're wondering what's happening in Germany. Are you safe there? I said, these fellows don't work in a mask anymore. In Bangladesh, everybody's wearing masks. What? They don't have masks? <laughs> so that's the kind of worry goes around. So I'm very happy that I took this opportunity to be here. And I see many of my friends that I haven't seen for many, many years now, and particularly this pandemic time. So very happy to be with you and also listening to all the stories about the presentations and the people that I met in these different places, visiting these projects and so on, very exciting experiences. Once you do something and you see that somehow your idea caught up, to somebody else. That's a very pleasing experience that uh, somebody felt the same way that you felt and did it the same direction. I've been talking to people, people invite me to discuss about what I did and I do it with enthusiasm, what I have done because I did the work in, with enthusiasm when people ask you, tell them I tell with the same enthusiasm about what I do. And some people ask, why do you waste your time talking to people? But nobody paid any attention to what you said. I said, maybe, I don't know. They invite me to come talk about my work. And I feel very excited about talking my work. I talk about it. So there are a thousand people sitting and listening to you. In 15 minutes after you finish your speech, they will all forget. I said, maybe, I don't know. But my job is to explain what I do, why I do. I do that. Then I added one more thing. I said, well, I'm not actually talking to 1,000 people. So no, there were 1,000 people there. They invited a big crowd, and you have a big crowd. Yeah, there were sitting people, 1,000. But I'm not speaking to the 1,000 people. So what do you do? I said, in my mind, I always speak to one person. Because within this thousand people, I know there's one person someplace. 
who is getting some vibes, what I say. And that's the important thing for me to come, to speak to him and to her. If I didn't, that vibration will not happen. So among many such things, I don't know who did what, Saskia is one. <laughs> because wherever he heard me, there were lots of people there. She mentions about London School of Economics, where you heard me speaking. They invited me to speak to their class, the big crowd of students. I had no idea there's someone, Saskia, sitting there. <laughs> you know what? So it somehow created some ripple. So all the story she's talking about, that ripple, how it developed and how it contaminated the minds of Sophie. They are sitting there <laughs> thinking in the same way. So it's good to see 10 years back what the ripple means to people. So that excites me that yes, there are people who is willing to do something very brave not in the same direction, but in a major departure what what he or she would be doing. So that makes me feel very happy that it is meaningful to talk to people, no matter how they are, oh, no, no, this is not going to work. That's okay. You think it doesn't want to work? You don't do it. I think it's going to work, I work it. So I have no fight with you. I have no quarrel with you. I'm not saying, no, no, you have to do it. I always say that this is a, what I talk about. It's not something parliament passing a law that you have to do this. I don't have any parliament to pass a law. I just, this is an option. If you come to it, think about it. An option, one very clear option was, and I found it easy to explain to people. This is option between charity. You can give away this money to solve the problem of water for the school children or creating employment for the unemployed young people or whatever she's talking about. You could have donated those money and make it happen. Or you can create a social business with the same money. So this is a choice I try to explain. The difference between the two of the charity and social business is very simple. So maybe it makes some sense to you. Charity money works only once. You do it, get it, and that's it. Your money will never come back. It's a good job. You have done something for people but only happens once. But if you use this money to invest, then it creates a business. Business is a very interesting crea creation of human being. Money goes out, does some work and come back. That's the trick of the business. And it, people learn it very quickly. Can I have the water? <coughs> Thank you. Learn this thing very quickly. And it became exciting because you make profit, create some surplus. So in our own work, so we thought instead of doing charity way, why don't we use it as a business? <coughs> Excuse me. This is the traveling thing, working on my throat. <laughs> so we started bus creating businesses. Grameen Bank was a business. We didn't, just didn't give the money to the poor people. Okay, you do something with the money. We could have done that. At the time, there is no rule for us. I'm just doing it individually. I said, no, it's a loan, you have to pay me back. So there's a departure. And instead of giving the money, there's a handout. I mean, the condition that you have to pay me back. 
So since it worked, and we are really excited about it, we got involved with other kinds of problems. Problem of healthcare. To begin with, toilet. There was no toilet in Bangladesh and many countries around. So one of the first thing that we noticed that uh, you spread diseases after diseases by the tradition that you continue. So we thought about it, how to bring this to the mind of the people that we work with, poor, extreme poor people. Toilet is too far away from their mind. House doesn't exist for them, forget about the toilet. So one easy way we explain, if you want to join Grameen Bank, by that time Grameen Bank becoming popular, everybody wants to join Grameen Bank because you get the money from them. So we thought that we have the power. We control that. You can join or not join because of our decision. So we said, our rule is, before you can qualify to even suggest that you want to join Grameen Bank, as a qualifying uh, thing that you have to do, you have to dig a hole and use it as a toilet. You cannot go anywhere you want. People didn't like it at all. But we are very tough. We said, no, if you don't do that, we say, sorry, we got to talk to you. So people came around that these guys are tough. If digging a hole brings money, we'll do that. And they did that. So these are, it didn't cost any money from our side, just an idea. Then as they were doing it, we knew that it's not a good solution. We were looking for a good solution. UNICEF came out with a beautiful design of a rural toilet, very inexpensive. We are taken by that design. So we said, why don't we produce this? So we started producing this toilet in the village because carrying it from city will add more cost than the real thing costs. It's a heavy thing, the concrete rings that you have to build. So we created an initiative to produce it in the village where it is needed. In order to do that, we created a separate company, a toilet company. To make it long story short, we started giving loan, a toilet loan, because we're a bank, we can do anything we want. <laughs> we gave her a toilet loan and say your repayment period doesn't bother us. You take as much time as you want. Just pay a little penny every week, that's all. Someday it will be all covered. They said it's not a burden on us. We got a real toilet right here. It looks very decent. Our toilet program became very popular because we are giving money. So money is not a problem. So they just go and buy it and install it. That created a repercussion within the village, particularly the higher level of income. The women became rebellious within the family. How come the beggar woman has a toilet? We don't have toilet. Because everybody's in the same boat. No distinction, everybody is going out. So it brought so much pressure because you are violating, you are moving away from your tradition. So you need a lot of pressure. And women needed to put this pressure because it's extremely hard for women. For men, they can wait until the sun goes down. No, they can do anything during the day. They couldn't care less. Anyway. But women had to wait until the sun goes down. This is a very, very big burden on her. So they became rebellious and brought this power. So our toilet business grew very well. They want to buy, we sell. We don't have to give loan to those people. It doesn't cost as much. So these are the idea gradually shaped what we later on call it's a non-dividend business. But to analyze it, explain it, we give it a short name, call it social business. Is that the thing that we're talking about now, this social business and so on? I'm happy that the people respond to that, understand that, and trying to see how it can be done. We say it's a non-dividend, 
business to solve human problems. That's all it is. It's not about making money for yourself. It's about solving problems. While it was a problem, we created a business. Healthcare is a problem, we created a business. Energy is a problem, we created a business, solar energy company. We became a huge nationwide company, solar energy. What is a business? But not to make money. So one after another, this is the direction we went. So we are very getting excited. And then we see bigger problem of the world. We participate in that. Poverty is a big issue because we work with the poor people. So one concluding remarks that we had in our work when people discuss with poverty, why there is poverty, can this be overcome someday? This is a very common question, where you go? So I have my ready answer out there because people ask me that question, I answer that question. I said, the way human beings are born, we have enough capacity to put poverty in the museum. Poverty should not be in the human society. It doesn't go together. Poverty and civilized human being doesn't work in the same space. Something we did wrong that we accommodated it because our mind got blocked someplace. Our job is to put the, music, put the poverty where it belongs. It belongs to the museum. So there are kids, children, when they go to school, they will have their tour of the museum, poverty museum. Then they will be asking why they are living like this. The teacher has to explain how stupid human being was at that time because of their behavior that created the problem of these people. How did now it disappear? How come we don't see them? So you start where it went, how it went to, finally to find the distillation in the museum. That's very simple. I said, that's what we're looking for, building poverty museum. I said, we should be announcing which city or which village in Bangladesh will have the first poverty museum that their village don't have any poor people. It's possible. It's not something art shuttering thing. Which city will declare it? The last poor person finally crossed over. We have a celebration. And then we create the museum that used to be poverty. Now, if we want to see poverty because it doesn't exist in our city, we have to go and see what it used to be. There's a long history of poverty. Why it was there, explanations and so on. So that was an issue, poverty. And another explanation for that, I said poverty, the more experience I have on that, makes it very clear to me, poverty is not created by poor people. As simple as that. You can go debate, find out, it's not a creation of poor people. Then where does this come from? My answer is poverty is created by the system. So if you want to see poverty disappear, all you have to do, rework on the engine. Tighten the screw, tighten the thing, slacken something. You have the right engine, which doesn't create poverty. One of the things I said in fixing that engine, what you have to do, create two kinds of businesses. We already have one kind of business to make money. You have to create another kind of business, not to make money, to solve problems exclusively. Because businesses always say, oh, we solve problems. Of course you do, but not exclusively. So you are halfway. I said, no, halfway doesn't lead us to the destination. We have to full way. You continue with your business to make money. I'm not objecting to that. I said, you have the capacity also to create a business, even a small one to solve the problem people have. And you have a list, that list is common for the whole world. Global problems. Global warming is one right away, everybody knows about. Poverty is another. 
water, shelter, income, employment. You know, so you create your business to solve the problem of 10 unemployment, 10 un unemployed people. So you created a business to solve the problem of 10 unemployed people by creating a social business. So take it from there. So that's the direction, okay? So this is a fixing of the system. I said, poor people are like bonsai tree. You know bonsai? You have the plant, this little, exactly the image of a tall, big tree, exact replica, but it grows only this big. The answer is very simple why it is like that. We took the same seed like the other tree in the forest, but put in a flower pot. So it grows with this much because it didn't have enough nutrition within that little soil that it had in the flower pot. So it grows this big. It looks exactly like that. I said, poor people are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with your seed. Simply society never gave them the space to grow as tall as everybody else. That's a symbol. So what we tried to do is to bring those soil closer to those poor people so that they can grow as tall as any human being will be. That's where the microcredit began. That's where the social business began and all the things we are talking about. Simply fixing the thing where we went made it wrong. Create those opportunities for people, create that. Then we are talking about three zeros, combining many problems. Global warming, zero net carbon emission, that's one zero. Wrote a book about it, explaining how to handle that. Book is nothing but what we did, how we tried to address it. Not as a scholar, as someone desperate to see, can I find a solution? As an individual journey, nothing else. It's not a big academic thesis. All as an individual, why, how you try to do it. Whether it works, it doesn't work, you make a judgment, it's all there. Then we brought the second zero. Zero wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is in the hands of only a few people. 99% of the wealth of the world is owned by only 1% of people. And it's very clear where they live, this 1%. They live probably in a dozen countries or 10 countries in the world. So literally, 99% of the world belongs to those 10 countries. The remaining 1% we're all talking about. So unless we address that issue, why they become the way to do. All the wealth love them, they go there. So it's a very simple thing. It's a question of redesigning financial system in a wrong way which our starting point was designing it the right way. So the microcredit, social business banking, all those things came into the picture, how we do that. So that's the target, how to fix the thing. The machine doesn't scoop up all the wealth and pushes in the top. While we are talking, that machine has not stopped. Whatever wealth the top people in the world had a few seconds back. Now, a few seconds later, they have more. Not because they are consciously trying to get it, it's a machine just doing this. So if you fix the machine, machine doesn't do in a one-sided way. It looks around so that the machine passes around wealth in any direction, not just in one direction then this problem can be handled. So we have to tweak the machine so that it can be fixed. The third zero is zero unemployment. That's a three zero that we keep talking about. 
that's about artificial intelligence. Because no matter how you look at it, you can debate it, but ultimately you will come to your own conclusion, like I have come to my conclusion. Artificial intelligence will not leave us any space for human being because of the way it is designed. Essence of artificial intelligence is machine learning. It's an unlimited process. So every second you become smarter. Human being cannot do that. Human being has a physical, biological limit where you have to stop. But machine becomes smarter. If the machine bec becomes smarter, what role human beings will be playing in this planet? That's the issue. And I, in my plant way, I said, human being will become garbage on this planet. They have no role. Because they have no role to play. Anyway, some smart people say, oh, oh don't worry about that. We are coming with solutions. I said, what is the solution? Their solution is, we will introduce universal basic income. I said, is this your solution? After all the years of, year of glory of human being, what they have done to the world, to the planet itself, ultimately to become beggars at the mercy of the machines, they will give us universal basic income, so I'll get a check from them and survive. I said, I don't want to live in this world. I want to take leave behind of that. As a human being, I want to retain my own dignity. I contribute. I create the world that I want. I don't want to live at the mercy of machines. They give me some monthly check or monthly food package. Universal basic income sounds so good. I said, not to me. So I said, we have to address that. I said, technology is a wonderful thing. But it could be a blessing. It could be a curse. Any, any technology. But this technology, artificial intelligence, is going very fast. And it will cross over the red line between the blessing and the cars. It will enter the cars very soon. We're coming very close. We now talk about fourth industrial revolution. See, very familiar. Everybody excited about the fourth industrial revolution. What is it all about? It's all about artificial intelligence. They are taking over. And we are welcoming, celebrating that. That's not what we want to do. So that's another three zeros. So we want to work on that direction. When pandemic began, for me on the 20th of March, as I told you, got inside my apartment and stayed there. Somehow it revealed everything that happened in the world. One of the first things that happened is the vaccine revealed the characters of human being. We were talking about global village. You know, it's a very popular thing. World has become a global village. When the vaccine came, or when the pandemic came, suddenly we discovered there is no village. All we saw, isolated islands. Each one trying to protect themselves. And before even vaccine was in the production line. We are appealing to the world. Right now, make a decision, global decision. This vaccine should be free from intellectual property rights. Otherwise, money makers will squeeze all those people who are about to die to get all the money they can get. And we gave examples how in previous years they have done that, make vaccines, medicines, patent free, so that it's available. So we said, this is a good occasion. 
it didn't get, go through. Then production began, vaccine came, we continued with our appeal, it didn't get anywhere. So the vaccine companies did lots and lots of money, lots of people died. By now, there are 70 million people were supposed to be, sorry, 70% of the people in the poor countries have to be vaccinated. That was the original plan. Now come back here, June 2022, only 16% have been vaccinated. Whereas in G10 countries, you do the boosted dose, one, two, three, then you donate vaccines to other countries. Most of the time, without any warning to the recipient country, they don't know there's a big chunk of vaccines coming. And many in those cases, they are not prepared for that to distribute all kinds of logistics problem. And some are very close to the expiry time. We have to dispose it off. So these are the kind of problems we have. So now we are coming to the punchline of that. We are saying we have to create social business pharmaceutical company. There's no escape from that. Because we cannot leave healthcare in the hands of people who could not care less about life. So we have to be people who are concerned about life, how to protect life, because technology gives us this opportunity. All we have to do is to create social business pharmaceutical company. So that's new campaign that we got. So you talk about the future, what we do in the 10 years, these are the steps that we have to take because things are getting bad. Before pandemic, we're in a bad situation. Whole world was about to coming to the finishing line because of the global warming and because of the other two mega problem that we talk about. After the pandemic, the finishing line has come closer. So when we talk about future, it's not a long future. We have to get ready and get into action. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Still <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Yunus. Um, I still remember vividly the very first day that I met you, got to meet you. I was one of those persons in the middle of the audience you probably never realized. Um, so it was, it was a great honor in the last 12 years, actually, for me uh, working with you. Um, and yeah, uh, talking about unemployment, I am the guy that had to um, cut over to the next session. So maybe that was my last time in the day in the job here. Um, hope not so. <laughs> Always good interrupting the boss. Um, well, we wanted to give the audience a bit of an opportunity to ask a few questions, sure. um, because I think um, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. The urgency that you're creating is something that we're feeling each and every day. And I think a lot of people here in the room have questions about, well, how do we actually make it happen, right? right. Um, what are the things that can work? So we have a couple of microphones in the room Lorelei and Sol uh, will be able to hand you those microphones. Um, so I'll open the floor directly for questions from the audience right now. And we'll have a few online as well. So you can type it into the chat if you want to have a question from online as well. Any first takers? I'm sure there's lots of questions going on. Yeah, we have one here right up front. <laughs> yeah, make them walk. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, it's working. Hello, Professor Yunus. Thank you very much, Saskia, again for being here with you. And uh, I would like to know about, uh, that's the way I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like to know, how do you think about it? Uh, the problems are so complex, so difficult to, to get solved. And the business, I think that cannot be solved. If we want to create the museum, we need to work together with the government, business, NGOs, universities, society, and everybody together. That's why I create my sure. organization called Somuzun. That means we are one. Right. That we can together do uh, our 
take our efforts to solve this problem and what what can business can do is different than what can government can do so uh how can we invite everybody to work together for this museum okay one quick answer for that uh, what i believe individual citizens working together is more powerful than the government so we don't wait for the government for example take a village in bangladesh or brazil wherever you are so we know how many people are unemployed they don't have any income they need income how many people are poor they don't have enough food so all we have to do is to come with the business ideas how to do that for the who are poor we one idea that you try to you have other ideas create a financial system for them give the money so that they can start a business people say oh no not everybody is an entrepreneur you are wrong people of need a special kind of talent to become an entrepreneur they are not educated they are remote area they don't have any market and so on i said i'm open to all that but i am someone who have done something to say in a concrete way we created a bank called gramin bank and expanded to the whole country every single village in bangladesh has a gramin bank existence so whatever you want you can take money from them and we came to 9 million families with this bank and mostly women 97% of our borrowers are women illiterate never seen any next village in their life they are so limited to their life they live they are born and live and die in the same village never had crossed across the border to the next village so i said we deal with them all we give them is money they start a business they have not gone to any business school or anything they never heard how to run a business so they do that it's a reality it's not just some cook up stories and they pay you back with interest regularly every day over years and years and years that's what the Grameen Bank is all about. If all these 9 million illiterate rural women can become entrepreneurs just because you give the money, anybody in the world can become an entrepreneur. That's my conclusion. Simply that money is not available. I keep insisting that money is the oxygen of entrepreneurship. If you connect that oxygen to the people who don't have the oxygen, suddenly they become alive their mind is their brain is start working they look around what my neighbor is doing oh i can do better than that if i only have the money and they'll give the money to become an entrepreneur so you bring entrepreneurship to the people and they can work to get themselves to get them out somebody doesn't have to pull somebody out of poverty every human being is packed with the capacity to take care of himself and herself and others that's what a human being simply we have not created institutions to support it. and for the unemployed young people in the village we created a social business venture capital fund we tell the young people don't go for the job job is a wrong direction job is a form of slavery you don't ever go there you are a human being be proud of being a human being you are an entrepreneur and tell yourself every day as, as you wake up that I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. And you have the money. You come up with a business idea. We invest in your business. That's separate from government bank. It's a venture capital fund. So we give you the money. And we become owner of your business, part owner, because we invested in your business. It's a tiny little business. But we become partner deal is you work hard make it successful return the money the share that we bought exactly the amount you i gave you you return your share is gone it's your business i am i'm not interested in your business i'm not interested in your profit 
I'm a social business. All I want to do is to make it happen. Today in Bangladesh, out of the venture capital fund, we recently created more than 100,000 young people take money and start a business. And the one idea after another idea they come up with. We have no idea how they come up with those ideas. But they come up because they see an opportunity to do things because money is available. Money is the key. Our banks close the door for those people. If any unemployed young person walk into the uh, lobby of a bank, they will be thrown out because we are not for you. So that's where the system goes wrong. That's, so you create the new system where you will be welcome. Our priority is to serve you first. Others are already taken care of, but we have to take care of you. Our priority is that. So, so that's the kind of change. So take one village, make everybody running a business, doing that or whatever. So you have overcome the poverty of one village. What Saskia was saying, if you can do with one village, you can do for the whole world. Same thing, it's just a repetition. Don't think that everything is different. The same system, same thing works. What I talk about the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, now they're doing it in the United States, called Grameen America. They work in 17 major cities in their country. New York, Boston, Houston, and all the big cities, Miami, Chicago, and so on. Lending money to the poorest women. No collateral, nothing. 100% repayment. Even during the pandemic, when everything stopped, Grameen America didn't stop. They continue because it's their life. They want to continue and do it. So repayment is 99% plus all these years of work that I've done. So that's it. So this is one example. I'm not saying others uh, the come up with ideas. That's all. I like how you say that so basically money is the um, oxygen. is the oxygen, and I think at the moment we are for, uh, taking money more as the purpose uh, in many large companies, uh, which is actually also something that we want to discuss on our corporate panel. Um, so unfortunately, we're running a bit um, out of time to do more questions. I know there's lots of interest in having those questions, but I know that we are also going to have the chance later on um, during networking and having a couple of conversations here um, over the fireside chat that will then continue tonight. So okay. we're looking very much forward to that. Um, again, back. now we're, we're going to bring on um, Monica, who is um, co-leading the uh, unit social business on the corporate side um, as a managing director. Um, she will be organizing and moderating the next panel, which is about corporate change makers um, and also the idea about um, what companies can do in the space of social sure. business. So I'll hand over to her. And thanks a lot, Professor Yunus. Thanks a lot, Dan. And with that, I'm inviting uh, our guest, Adair Fox Martin, to please come on stage. Adair is the president of Google Cloud International and also the head yes, of you. Google Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Previously, Adair served uh, on the executive board of SAP SE, leading the company's global sales, services, and customer engagement teams, and had various positions at Oracle. Adair is also the global executive sponsor for social enterprise at Google. And as the founder of One Billion, One Billion Lives, excuse me, we heard about that before as well. Um, and she's also a global bi-social ambassador for Social Enterprise UK. And we're gonna talk about that on our panel. I'm also inviting Emmanuel Faber, um, unfortunately no. not on stage. Um, he couldn't make it in person, um, but he's gonna join us larger than life on <laughs> this screen, hopefully in a second. Um, so he's already online. Um, and as we're in this hybrid environment, I think, um, it's a very fitting position for him. Um, so hopefully, are you there? Um, yes, hello. Um, happy to have us uh, have you with us. Hi. So um, Emmanuel Faber is the chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board of the IFRS Foundation. Um, and we're gonna hear um, about his work in just a minute. Previously, he served as the uh, CEO and the chairman of the board of directors at Danone. At Danone, Emmanuel initiated the social business joint venture Grameen Danone Foods. Uh, he also served as the director of the Danone Communities Mutual Investment Fund. Uh, and as a CEO, he extended Danone's multi-stakeholder 
approach uh, to business and changed its legal status towards an enterprise uh, mission. Um, and please excuse my French here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, without further ado, um, Emmanuel. Um, you met Professor Yunus in 2006, um, so also quite a while ago, um, and you were inspired by his vision of social business. Yet, at the time, you served as the vice president for the Asia Pacific region at Danone, and you did not immediately quit your job within the corporation to start a social business. Instead, you decided to incorporate his vision and his approach into your corporation. So can you tell us a little bit uh, what inspired you about uh, Professor Yunus vision of social business and how it influenced your career? Yeah, thanks Arti and thank you uh, everyone for having me. I'm really sorry that I cannot uh, join this incredible crowd that I see on the screen here. You, you have all been uh, partners in crimes and brothers in arms and sisters in arms and Saskia, Sophie and the likes. So I would have just love to be with all of you, but COVID got me in the wrong place. That was my first time in Davos and I got COVID there. So, you know, there are places where <laughs> you wonder whether you really need to go. Um, so sorry, I can't be there. Um, Professor Yunus, I, you know, I owe you a big hug at some point because it's been too long that we haven't seen each other. So hopefully that'll be soon. Um, well, I mean, it, it's it's super hard to answer such a broad question in, in such a short time. But in essence, what Professor Yunus was just um, sharing about Grameen Bank in the in the previous question, I think is what really inspired me. I could have decided to quit indeed and to go into social entrepreneurship and basically what Saskia and Sophia and others and many of you around the screen had done, and I think that's fantastic that you guys do that. But I also believe that there is a need to transform uh, the, the world from inside as well, from the large companies, because without the large companies, it will be uh, very long to not, uh, you know, to, to get things uh, changed. Not that it is easy within the large companies, but they, um, they are a very powerful model and, and Professor Yunus explained that as well about vaccines. And I think I thought that there was uh, basically um, an opportunity to inoculate the social business uh, virus into the corporate world. And that's what I decided to do. Um, and that started uh, in November 2005 when uh, for the first time in my life, I landed in, in Dhaka and then many more times after with a few of my colleagues and we started drafting the Grameen Food uh, then an, um, uh, uh, initiative together, the social business joint venture that we created. What struck me was um, that, you know, profit, as Professor Yunus said, is, is something that companies look at it in a very, in a way, selfish manner, I would say. And therefore, it's putting them in competition. But social business, because there is no profit or no dividend to be made, uh, suddenly you don't have anything that you should fight for. So you have to think about why do you exist? If it is not for making profit and return money to your shareholders, what is it that makes you unique, that uh, makes your company in fact full if it is not for shareholders? And this question that social business raises, I found extremely interesting in terms of reconnecting, reconnecting uh, the mission of the company uh, with um, its people today, uh, the countries in which it operates. What are we best at? What is it that makes this company worth existing? What do we serve? Uh, and when we drafted uh, those documents together, it, it appeared very clearly in Bangladesh, we were here to serve the, 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 the children of the you know, most poor uh, families in the, in the countryside with a very powerful, small, but fortified yogurt that would impact their health, their mental health, cognition, I mean, ability, cognitive abilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it worked. And so 
instead of me quitting and joining immediately Bangladesh and, and you know and, and the Yunus band, um, I decided that we we would look at the whole company this way. And I find it again super interesting because as I said, um, profit is dividing. You know, this part of profit is mine and this is yours. But when it's about the mission and the social business, it's all together. So by putting profit outside of the, of the table, you're basically demilitarizing the zone of collaboration. So suddenly you have more people that come because they know you're not here to make profit. They're ready to come because, you know, NGOs have helped us in, in uh, they, they've brought us money as a multinational company you know, to, to support the social business in Bangladesh, NGO, the Swiss NGO, for instance, and, and many others. And the Gates Foundation and others have actually funded some of the research and the clinical research that we are making, simply because, and again, there is, we are not here to make money. And so suddenly you collaborate instead of competing. And I found this incredibly powerful in terms of uh, system change. And this is why we decided to push it uh, into, uh, into the company and beyond. And I see my friend Jacques here, Berger, and the Action Tank in Paris. And, and Saskia is a board member. YSB is a board member of Action Tank, which is a group of um, now more than 12 or 15 large companies that are working with NGOs and civil society and uh, philanthropies and others to make things change and develop social business models. So I'll stop here because I could be long, but uh, it's a privilege to be spending some time with you uh, this afternoon, my friends. So unfortunately, Unfortunately, the COVID virus prevented you from coming here, but I love your analogy of the virus of social business. That's one that we would like to spread today. Uh, that's what we're here for, right? Um, so Adair, uh, we heard uh, from Emmanuel how you rewired a global company towards more purpose. Um, and we, we are also very intrigued by that question. So my colleague Stan and Artie ask um, around 40 CXOs um, and also investors, what they as leaders um, do for to transform their companies uh, towards purpose. Um, you weren't asked for that, but you're here with us on stage today. So can you tell us a bit about your work um, at Google, how you work with social entrepreneurs? Because that was in fact, one of the main driving factors for social innovation and social businesses within a large corporation to open up a space for regular employees to create social businesses and create social innovations. And we know that you are active, very active in that space. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for, the, for your time. And um, I just wanted to comment on, on your remarks. I, I felt that it was so classy, so graceful, and so full of humility that it was super inspiring. Thank you very, very much. It was uh, wonderful to spend the afternoon here. Um, uh, for me, when I think about corporate contribution, you know, the social entrepreneurship programs um, have many different aspects uh, uh, associated with them. And uh, of course, you're essentially giving your employees the permission uh, and the tools and the technology and the time and the space to go and whilst they're still in employment, you know, do all of the things that they that they care about so much. Um, and the impact from an engagement perspective is enormous, actually, uh, for, for corporations, as is the impact for the initiatives and the ventures that they run. Um, you know, the One Billion Lives initiative came out of a time that I spent in Asia, when in, uh, I think, to Professor Yunus's remarks, when in, in many cases, you know, the, the actual visceral visibility between the haves and the have-nots was uh, something that was quite confronting. Um, and, um, you know, I, I decided that if our business was operating in one of the most populous regions on the planet, then, you know, to take an audacious role for positive impact uh, would be something that we should align with our audacious goals that we had for our business. Um, when I think more generally about in a practical way, the way that corporations can help contribute to um, you know, to social businesses. I just see it really in four areas, and this is very pragmatic and, and practical. The first, I guess, is, you know, providing social businesses with access to funds, access to capital. 
at various different stages, and perhaps not just for the social entrepreneurs themselves, but also in the context of the ecosystem that you need to build to support uh, the, social, um, the social enterprise network. The second is access to your value chain. Um, and there's probably more that we can discuss about that when we look yes. at the concept of social procurement. Um, the, the third is access to your core differentiator. So as a business, what is your core differentiation about? In our case in Google, it's about tech. So how do we provide access to our tech to social enterprises so that they can continue to grow and extrapolate their own impact and outcome? And then the fourth is access to your talent. How can you take the talented individuals within your organization and create an environment where they can contribute meaningfully to social business, perhaps with some of the skills, the knowledge or the experiences that might not exist within that social business itself? And we can see that right now as we currently have a team of 15 to 16 Googlers who are um, working very closely um, with the government in Poland, building right now a platform um, that will, in the next six weeks, we hope, manage the humanitarian uh, crisis that Poland is experiencing, uh, you know, in a much more uh, consistent and coherent way and provide information when it's needed. So I think there are four very practical ways that corporations, you know, whilst meeting the goals of their corporation, can still contribute meaningfully to the world of social business. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that all sounds really great. Also, Emmanuel's examples. Um, at the same time, we see that not all contribute, uh, all corporations all the time contribute to the three zeros um, yet, at least. So, Professor Yunus, I invite you back on stage. Um, what, are, what do you see as the current uh, challenges to turn even more corporations into friends of social business? And obviously, if you have solutions to overcome those challenges, we're also happy to hear them. <laughs> uh, it's an ongoing system. It's very difficult to turn it around, do things differently. But the slow motion goes, like uh, Emmanuel explaining. Uh, they had no idea what Grameen Bank is when we first started talking. Uh, again, lecture, speech attended by them, clicked something, invited me to have more discussions. The chairman of Danone became excited. He said, I'm going to do it. And that was the beginning of it. It was not easy process for them. Just to give an example how it was not easy. Uh, everything was set, all agreed, signed. We created a company called Grameen Danone Company. And the total uh, investment is $1 million. Half a million will be given by Danone and half a million will be given by us, Grameen. Oh, we are excited. We are having a joint venture with a mega company. So immediately we put our money into the company, half a million. But Danone doesn't give any money. So we waited and waited, sent letters, emails, and finally said, well, just have a little patience. We are struggling with it. Big company struggling with half a million. So we got worried. We said, uh, do you want to change your mind that you don't want to do it anymore? We're okay. You asked for it. We went ahead. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine with us. No, 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 no. We are very much in it. Simply, we have a problem. Our lawyers, company lawyers, refuses to put this money in this company. Why? Because they say the mandate the shareholders gave you is to make money. You cannot take shareholders' money to invest in a company who outright says we'll never give you a dividend because it's in the document that will never give you any dividend. So it's a violation of the mandate of the shareholders. You cannot use company money. So I said, what does it mean? Is it end of it? No, 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 it's not end of it. We will find solutions. Go found the solution after lots of work. In the annual general meeting, they announced how much money they made this year and how much dividend each shareholder is getting. And all those beautiful statements and numbers and so on, everybody's impressed. Then they say, we are circulating a paper because we are going to invest half a million dollars in a Bangladeshi company that we are going to do. It's a social business. It will never give us any dividend to whoever wants to buy a share of it, but it will do something very important. It will bring nutrition to the malnourished children of Bangladesh. 
That's our commitment in the company. If by any chance, if you are interested, shareholders, if you are interested in this paper, you sign it, say how much money of the money that you received as a dividend from Danone would like, you, you would like to invest in this company. That's it. If you don't want to invest, fine. If you want to invest one euro, fine. Whatever it is. 98% of the shareholders signed up. It brought 35 million euro. We needed only half a million. They were surprised that they got such a wide respect for that. They feel very good that their shareholders are so much with them. It's, a, it's outside the company now. The shareholders, as individual person, invested in a company, they recommended it and they said, that created a big problem for Danone. All the employees, Danone works all over the world, you know that. Lots of employees. Employees in a body protested against the decision of the company. They said, do you consider us a second class citizen? You asked the shareholders about this company, how much money they want to invest. You never bothered to ask us. Are we so low in our system? So the company got the message, had to write another letter to all the employees. Here is a company we are going to do, blah, blah, blah. It will never give you any dividend, but it will do this. Another 30 million euro came. So in total, they got 65 million euro. As uh, he's hearing it, <laughs> the story of that. What do they do? They created social business fund so that they can continue investing in all kinds of social. They work in social business in 14 different countries right now. So this is really a creative way. Danone didn't spend a penny out of this company, but it excited everybody. That's the power the companies have. Thank you. So the role of employees, but also the role of shareholders. Emmanuel, that's something that you work actively on. Um, in your role with the ISSB, you work towards unified standards for sustainability disclosure for investors who need those informations. So can you tell us a bit about why that is important and how it helps corporations, but also social businesses around the world? Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, Professor Yunus, it's, it's great to uh, you know, listen to your uh, encounter of how things happened at, uh, at the Lund with, uh, with Ramin and with yourselves. That was certainly transforming moments. And uh, to the point that Professor Yunus was just making that um, you know, uh, big business is built to maximize profit, uh, in particular listed companies, uh, and I know that, you know, Saskia, myself had long, long conversations uh, with, you know, and how to, for YSB to, to be able to um, um, entice new large companies into doing more social business with uh, Professor Yunus' uh, concept successfully. Uh, but there is always this um, system, uh, you know, barrier that is there. The system is not uh, designed to do this. And Professor Yunus was you know, talking a little bit about the legal aspects and the limitations and the fact that indeed we had to go for approval to our shareholders for very small amounts of money, uh, because in principle, we were not supposed to do that. So the, the, uh, now that I have uh, you know, free time, not being a CEO anymore, uh, I decided that I would uh, accept the mission for the next uh, three years um, to uh, lead uh, the, the board, the independent board, that will establish um, the standards uh, for uh, environmental, social and governance um, <coughs> matters uh, for uh, the capital markets. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just use uh, the example of climate uh, because I think uh, we would all agree here uh, that uh, there will not be climate and social, I mean, social justice without climate justice. And, and the two together as, are going to be there. The most vulnerable people are also the most vulnerable people to climate. So climate is a fundamental topic. And yet companies find it very difficult to talk about climate to their shareholders. 
So if now we create a language that becomes a mandatory uh, because it would become through the countries and the regulations all over the, you know, the, all the stock exchange commissions around the world that companies have to disclose, for instance, their scope one, two, and scope three, um, you know, that net zero targets, the investment that they need to require to do there, to, to get there, how they govern that, et cetera, et cetera, and, the, and report their performance on climate year after year, then you start being able to having one language on which companies and investors can start talking. And so for instance, uh, if one company you know, has made that commitment to go down in carbon intensity, whatever, and is late um, you know, when it delivers its numbers at the end of the year or after two or three years, then the question will be for investors, well, I mean, you have committed, are you going to delay your commitment or is it that you're, you have not been performing well enough or you're late in your investments. If you're late in your investments, it means you need more investments and we don't have that in our model. If there is more investments and we don't have it, then it means that you are going to have more debt. If you have more debt, your share price should be lower. So the net net of this is you might end up with a situation where three years down the road, as much as you know, some CEOs and boards are terrified about the idea of having a profit warning. Tomorrow, they may be terrified about having a carbon warning. And so, that, that, you know, the idea of what we are trying to do is to create decision useful standard disclosures that would become mandatory for all large companies and large uh, uh, investors in the world um, in order to gradually shift this very slow motion uh, system that Professor Yunus was describing, because I, I think there is today a tremendous uh, need for rewriting economics. Uh, our, our economics are blind. Um, and in particular, I think for any company tomorrow that wants to um, you know, create uh, entrepreneurship um, for social business or joint venture social businesses or even go into social businesses, companies that want to become public benefit corporations or entreprise à mission as we, as we became at the none, uh, these disclosures will help those companies to have the right dialogue with their shareholders and for them to understand what is at stake and be able to provide the capital in a much uh, easier manner. So that's uh, the essence of uh, what I'm trying to do uh, with, uh, with our board here. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Adair, <clears throat> uh, now we heard quite a bit about um, purpose transformation from the inside, how we can transform large corporations for good. Uh, with entrepreneurship, for example. Along the way, there's also the possibility to work with social businesses that exist already, which we call social procurement. Uh, we released a report on that last year um, and just pre-launched a follow-up last week in Davos. Um, and you are very familiar with the topic as an ambassador for, uh, for as a global bi-social ambassador, sorry for that, uh, for uh, Social Enterprise UK. Um, so why is this topic close to your heart um, and how can we support it as a win-win for corporations and social businesses? I think when you think about procurement in the corporate sense, it's probably one of the easiest levers that you can pull to affect change. Um, and, and when you think about most businesses, regardless of what you do, whether you're a technology company, whether you're manufacturing shoes, whether you're manufacturing cars, every single company has a wide range of indirect goods and services that they can procure. And they're just the things that keep your business ticking over. And if you do a quick compare, there is some data that suggests for every $1 that a company would give in its CSR programs, and we discussed the, the pros and cons of that charitable position earlier, that for every $1, they spend $400 on just the stuff that you need to run the office, to run the business. The paper in the printers, the coffee in the machines, the facilities and so on. So the intent here is to redirect some of that spend to socially minded businesses so that the outcome 
of the dollars that you are spending extrapolates much farther than beyond your own value chain. Um, and you know, this is something that we kicked off quite a while ago. <laughs> Um, and, and, and a number of interesting, interesting elements on, on the journey along the way. First of all, I started with one geography, one country, and committed 5% of our indirect spend to socially minded businesses. Within a very short period of time, we'd blown through past that and we were already at nine. Um, my chief procurement officer described himself as, I still have the CPO title, but now I'm the chief purpose officer. You know, for the first time, I feel that I don't just have a backroom function, that I'm not just negotiating on a set of terms, but that I'm actually looking at how we wisely invest and spend the company's money for good and for impact. Um, it was quite a journey with uh, many of the social enterprises that we engaged with. Uh, it was a journey of learning. Um, it was a journey of creating an environment where people could uh, deal with the nuances of corporate procurement because that is not easy um, and making uh, some of the social enterprises that we were dealing with corporate procurement ready. And it was also about looking at your own supply chain because in many instances, your tier one suppliers are quite large suppliers and a social enterprise independently could not meet the obligations of that major contract, but that through your tier one suppliers, you push down the requirement to have a percent going through socially minded businesses lower down in their contract with you, in other words, with the two, tier two or the tier three. So it was um, quite an incredible experience, quite a journey, much that we've learned along the way, many companies looking at how they can explore this opportunity, because honestly, procurement is one of the easiest levers that as an organization you can choose to pull and by pulling that lever, you can have incredible impact. You can choose to buy a ream of paper for your printer, or you can choose to buy a ream of paper for the same price, at the same quality, delivered under the same terms and conditions, but know that every penny of profit from that ream of paper is going to the education of young girls in Africa. And one of the uh, byproducts of this was actually just the employee engagement that occurred around the fact that the coffee we were drinking was from a company that was affecting change for homelessness people, you know, that uh, the paper that we were dealing with was, was uh, you know, facilitating education and so on. And so it became an, a massive opportunity for engagement. So this is something that we're actively working with. I know that there are many companies out there that are doing this today, but it's only a small proportion of what is actually possible. And so this is, I think, a mission that can affect change in a very, very easy way, because this is a very simple lever to pull. Now that's a call to action, I would say. Uh, <laughs> just um, adding to that, we heard uh, how companies, large companies, corporations, uh, can turn their businesses into a force for good by involving their employees, by involving their shareholders, and by involving their suppliers. Maybe in 30 seconds or less, we have a room full of change makers here from all sorts of different backgrounds. What's your advice, starting with you, Professor Yunus? Uh, what can we all do affecting change towards the three zeros in the next decade? Let's change it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to be done. If that. See, we, where's the easy way? I mean, these are examples we're talking about. She gave lots of examples. Uh, Danone is an example. And the Danone representative will be coming tonight to see us. Yes, you see they're coming to discuss something. Uh, uh, we work with McCain. Uh, McCain never had any interest whatsoever in Bangladesh, never heard of it. Um, they got so excited about it. It's a family owned company, a Canadian company. Uh, got so enthusiastic about the idea. That's it. They never met me. So they send their representative to attend my lectures wherever I speak so that they can report back to the owners. This is what he's talking about. It's a family owned business. And they got excited. They want to do that. And that's the beginning of uh, Danone, uh, sorry, uh, McCain program and so on, a social business created for that. And simple idea uh, that uh, uh, you, they are buyers of potatoes. There's a big buyer of potatoes, particularly in France. I don't know how much potato they buy here. Uh, major buyer. So they buy only a portion of the, all the total uh, production of the potato because they want to buy the size of the potato, which, is, which will be producing largest number of French fries. 
as simple as that. So anything which is not good for their machine, they will not buy it. So they are the, those are the French fry companies are the major buyers of those uh, potatoes. This I learned from them. So, and uh, lots of potatoes are just returned. The farmers have no use for that. I, the dioxide was too old. Eat very small amount, it was wasted. So what they did as idea of the social business, this came up with the idea, they create a company to produce potato soup. And French uh, chefs came up with the competition to design the best potato soup, uh, potato soup recipe. So that you have a picture of the uh, chef and a good potato soup. And suddenly something that you wasted is now become a good food for everybody. So they expanded it to uh, vegetables. 30% of the vegetables grown in Europe, I think again, this I get from them, their statistics. 30% of the vegetables are thrown away for the simple reason they don't have the right shape. Banana has to be absolutely <laughs> classic shape. If it is deviation, nobody will touch it. Cucumber has to have a very smooth shape. If it is fat on one end, thin on another end, nature does it many different ways. Nobody will touch it. It will not go into any grocery shop. It's all wasted with 30% of the total. It's good food. It's Speaking. wasted away. Nobody bothers about it. So they said, well, we use the same principle, vegetable soup. So they came up with the vegetable soup. When you make a soup, you don't care about the shape of the original. <laughs> these, are, these are crazy things we do in business. So you come up with the idea to do that. So each one, like a, a Uniqlo, we have nothing to do with Uniqlo. There's a big fashion company, a global company, but the Inaisan, who is the owner of the company, became very interested in our subject. When I was visiting Japan, he invited me to come and meet him over lunch. So I, I had no idea what he wants. He said, can we do some social business? I said, of course, anybody can do social business. Anybody can do a social business. Yep. You heard that. So um, this is how it's a whole uh, Uniqlo, Grameen Uniqlo is created. It's a whole fashion, but for the poor people. People who don't have the uh, warm clothing in winter, Bangladesh winter can get very rough because we are a summer country, warm country, but the winter gets a little bit too harsh on us and very short period. Many people die of our winter because it, our houses are built for air, no protection for cold weather. And old people die, children die because they cannot tolerate that cold. So they came up with the simple blankets out of the waste of all the businesses they do in the garments. They have so much waste. So they started taking those waste to recycle them and to do them in the, for the poor people, a whole line of fashions. That's it. This is a simple idea. It's so simple. So Adair, in 10 seconds or less now, <laughs> can you tell us your advice? Well, you gave him 30. <laughs> I gave him, yeah, 31 maybe, 31. <laughs> Um, well, I, I guess maybe I'll just do it on the corporate perspective. I and mean, we heard earlier how, you know, social businesses can be exclusive in their focus. And obviously in corporate structures, that's that's not um, possible today. But I think when we are looking at how we engage, we, it has to be inclusive and it has to be in a way that's sustainable in the core of your business, not like a special project. When you build it into the core of your business, then it becomes part and parcel of what you do every day, how you breathe, how you think, and then how you potentially have impact. Thank you. Emmanuel, your one word uh, advice to the, co to the change makers in this room. <laughs> yeah, well, 10 words. Um, I think, first of all, that when you think of uh, your business as a social business, you really start thinking of why it is useful beyond money. And, and money is necessary, but that's the goal. that's not the goal. And and I would really encourage all of you, all of us, to to reconsider that, you know, because it's a, it's a game changer in how you're looking at what you do every day and why you do it. That's the first thing. And the second, don't wait. Don't wait, you know, because if you're in these pyramids of of corporates, you inherit your ability to move things because you have power. You have a team, you have an organization, you have a responsibility, accountability, whatever, all the processes. But power and leadership do not work very well. 
leadership starts where you challenge your own power by taking risks of moving the organization where you think it should be moving. And this is where intrapreneurship starts. And the more you will have power, the less it will be easy to exercise your, your leadership. I can tell you. <laughs> so don't wait. Do it now. Uh, life is too short and this is too fun. Are there? We heard a lot about how everybody can be a change maker and we shouldn't wait to do that. Um, and we also don't want to leave you waiting. It's time for a break. And my colleague Artie is going to introduce uh, because, of course, you have a small task during the break. Um, so, Artie, can you please tell everybody um, what's going to happen in the next few minutes? Come on up here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here to announce the break, but I'm not going to do that just yet, because I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, what about the tools that we have for you to be able to transform your company. So we've heard in this panel, um, you know, very powerful call for action. Um, and uh, we set up a little research unit at YSB about three years ago, um, in which we've developed, um, just waiting for the slides to come up. <laughs> in which we've developed um, yeah, a series of reports that really focus on how companies can transform um, their organizations towards purpose. Um, this research, we, you know, we've done this with a range of partners. These are some of them with uh, INSEAD, with the Schwab Foundation, with Porticus, uh, and with um, uh, Ashise. Could we get to the next slide, please? Yeah, great. So this is just um, to give you a quick overview of some of the reports that, that you, know, you might find useful in your journey. Um, there are many different ways to transform your company. We've heard about some of them. Uh, social entrepreneurship, creating social business is a powerful way um, to start. And the first report, Business is Unusual, uh, distills learnings from about 50 interviews that we did with leading social entrepreneurs uh, from Danone, SAP, um, IKEA, and many, many others into a playbook. So that's one resource that you can use. Um, if, uh, you know, Adef um, uh, talked about social procurement, we, uh, we launched a report with, uh, with SAP and with BCG at Davos recently, which talked about the fact that uh, in the next decade, social procurement is going to be a, a half a, a $500 billion market opportunity for impact. Um, if you want to know how to get started, we have a social procurement manual, which again has lots of case studies and tools and frameworks to help you get started. Um, and then finally, um, what we heard in all these pieces of research again and again, is that one of the toughest things uh, in this transformation journey is the corporate immune system. The old immune system, which essentially tries, destroys anything that is uh, focused on purpose. And so if you want to rewire that corporate immune system, um, you can use this playbook that we're launching in September. And that, again, distills um, learnings from about 25 CEOs. We also interviewed about 15 investors, asset managers, asset owners, uh, ESG investors, and put that together into a purpose playbook, which again has tools, frameworks on how to transform the different um, functions of your company so that you can enable the work that, um, that social entrepreneurs are, are trying to do. Um, so that's a little bit about the research. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here and finally let you go on a break. But before we do that, there's a little bit of homework. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's, it's, it, we're not done yet. We wouldn't be YSP if we wouldn't give you a little bit more homework. So we'd like, uh, you know, as Saskia said, there's some amazing people in this room, a lot of partners, old friends of YSP. Um, so we'd like you to get to know each other um, and we'd like you to do that by using the break um, to sort of answer three questions. Uh, the first is, if you can turn to, uh, you know, the person sitting next to you and introduce yourself. Um, second, what is it that you, what is it that you do um, to create a world of three zeros? Um, and what's the third question of, forgot. <laughs> And, and, and sorry, yeah, and, and what's your relationship with YSP? So that's the second question. And the third is, what do you actually do? Um, and with that, now you can go on a break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
The break is going to be for 15 minutes. <clears throat> uh, nobody's listening. Please be back in 15 minutes. No, go ahead, please, please, yes. Because I'm really fascinated by your talk about microfinance and That's right, yeah. yeah. This will be really okay. So I have a little bit of you are with?
I know everyone hates the person cutting and ending the break. I'm really sorry, I hate having that role, but we have uh, still an exciting, a lot of things to discuss. So let's keep things going. Um, I would like now for that second part and for the following panel to introduce uh, to you all our COO, Tom Coxis. Please, round of applause. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So the next uh, chapter, the next panel, we will talk about how actually everything makes, how we make it happen. Actually, not us, but the social businesses that we work with. So we are fortunate enough to have um, two social business owners with us today, one from Colombia, actually two from Colombia, but they're representing one business, and then uh, from Kenya. So first, I would like to call to the stage um, Rodrigo and Paolo from uh, Cerro, Colombia, as well as uh, Gaia from our Colombia team, our country leader from Colombia. And next is uh, David Wanjao from uh, DivaBits Clear Energy from Kenya, one of our portfolio businesses, as well as Susan, our country leader from, uh, from Kenya. So first of all, thank you very much for making the long trip. I know it's been very long from, from Colombia and equally long because of different difficulties in, in travel from, from Kenya. So first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our, our friends from Colombia, and then I pass it, you know, a couple of questions. Um, Cerro Colombia, it's a very interesting business. I was fortunate enough to visit them actually a couple of months ago. And uh, having been educated as an engineer, I could understand somewhat about the business, but it was, it was super interesting and, and exciting to see how they transform uh, second, third grade fruit into a very high quality product that's desirable across the world. So let me pass it to uh, Paulo and Rodrigo, the brothers, um, and then they can share about the business. And the question is, how did, you, how did you get the idea? How did you get into this business? Because it's again, it's somewhat a unique product. It's a unique transformation of, of uh, produce in a sense. So how did you get started and where the idea came from? Okay, well, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous honor to be here. Um, Cerro Colombia was uh, based on the idea of, of um, improving quality of life through the best ingredients. Uh, so we are a family owned company, uh, three Colombians, two brothers, engineers and a childhood friend uh, who, who came up with this idea of, of uh, exporting a lot of the talent and a lot of the agricultural potential that Colombia has, uh, turning this into quality ingredients uh, for, for the world markets. Um, where the idea came from, uh, we, we've always sort of understood that Colombia has a lot more to offer um, and uh, we wanted to sort of uh, make that bridge. Um, Paolo takes care of uh, the operation side of the business. I take care of these uh, sales, and, um, and 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 together we what we do is is uh, improve the quality of a lot of the value chain and the people in the value chain through these through these ingredients. Yeah, hi. Um... So to give you a bit more detail about what exactly it is that we do, the product. Um, so we, we do freeze drying. You probably, maybe some of you know what, what freeze drying is, but uh, how this um, has to do with the, the impact that, that, we, that we generate is we, like Rodrigo said, we know there's a lot of potential in agriculture in Colombia, but the difficulty has always been, well, exporting fresh fruit is a, you know, very high risk. Some people do it. Some people are 
very uh, successful with it, but not many farmers can all of a sudden say, hey, I'm gonna export a container of fresh bananas or mangoes or pineapples. Uh, so we found in freeze drying a way of um, reducing that risk significantly, uh, while at the same time buying, being able to buy that fruit from uh, the farmers, which is very difficult to sell to either a supermarket or for it to be exported. Uh, just like Professor Yunus was saying just a little bit uh, a while ago, a banana, if it doesn't have the exact shape, well, you probably won't grab it at the supermarket, so it's not put there. Uh, for us, we're going to peel that banana, we're going to uh, cut it, it might end up even in a powder as an ingredient for a smoothie. So it really doesn't matter uh, you know, how that peel was. And then uh, obviously that generates a big impact on the farmers because uh, you know, nature doesn't give you a hundred perfect bananas. It might give you 70 and then there's 30, which they're not sure what to do. And it ends up being uh, food waste. Um, so that's one of the, the big impacts that we have, which is, you know, by definition, a part of our, of our product. Um, I guess that um, even though we started uh, transforming this fruit freeze dried uh, into snacks, what one of the application, um, we soon realized that having a brand and having a facility as a startup is, is probably very difficult. You're, you're not going to have the resources for both. So we pivoted into production only. So, well, engineer from Georgia Tech, Purdue University, let's start a freeze drying facility. That can be that hard. Uh, <laughs> and then, so we found a, a customer said, you know what? Uh, they need a container of one product. They just need organic bananas. They need a container a month. And at that stage, uh, we had bought, you know, we had imported this uh, machine, which we got from a lease from a bank. Uh, and we we're got... Sure, we're not sure yet why the <laughs> bank approved the lease, but... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, sales guy goes, you know, we're sold out. One client, one product, we just need a, one container a month, that's it. And then, and then the then... operations guy <laughs> says, hey... Our machine can only do one container a year, <laughs> and and that's that's where as an entrepreneur you 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 get that you hit that wall. It's like ah, oh, oh we, we don't have anything. Like there's there's three or four uh, freeze dryer equipment manufacturers in the world. We researched, we looked, we tried to negotiate. It had had no economic sense. We could not buy one of those machines. There was there was no way. Uh, so we go back to our initial motivators, like, what do you do? Like, you can buy the machine. What you have is, is very tiny. What do you do? So you, you go back to, to that talent that, that you have in Colombia and, 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 and in, 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 in our community to that passion. And uh, at that stage, we had already obviously broken that machine, learned to fix it, right? <laughs> Improved it. Because, and he said, what? Well, let's let's now build the machine ourselves. Everyone was laughing at us, of course, but uh, we are located in a in a region where it, it's a sugar cane cluster. So there is more than twelve sugar cane, cane mills that have been operating for for a century. That organically has developed a lot of technical and technicians in the community. So, and we were always thinking, how do you how do you take advantage of all that talent? Well, here, here it was. Um, we we're now designing, building, and operating freeze dryers in, in Colombia. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty strange. Our quality uh, complies with the, the highest standards. We're selling to any, cost, any customer, uh, being in the food industry, being the nutraceuticals, uh, even cosmetics, uh, because everyone is looking for truly natural uh, ingredients. So... That was also part of part of the journey. Um, I don't know, Tom. That's no. we can listen to it for a long time. Because <laughs> I know so now it's clear that you 
you got the support from a bank. We don't know how. I mean, nobody's gonna ask. <laughs> but uh, we've been working with uh, the Cero for for a few months only so mm -hmm. far. But what would what has been your experience? What are the values? What are the the support that you you received? The learnings, perhaps, that you you got from working with you know so far? Uh, well, obviously, like any world class in investment source. Uh, getting the money was not easy. <laughs> uh, the due diligence process was a very uh, interesting and learning experience for us. Being able to succinctly uh, communicate what we have developed for over 10 years, uh, trying to explain this complex process in an industry where even the bigger players are still privately owned companies. So there's not a lot of information around. It was, it was it was a very good uh, experience for us. But now we have a very robust business plan that we can share with the investment community. Uh, obviously, this helps a lot as a, as a leverage with, with clients, uh, with suppliers, and even with government entities that are trying to, to push uh, for this. Um, we also, we're, we're also learning a lot about the impact metrics. So we've got clients uh, that have visited us saying, you know what, you comply with a lot of the social and environmental standards. Why don't you certify that? There are, you know, there, there are certification bodies that do that. Uh, so we, we brought that and, and we're learning how to measure you know, KPIs and, and, and translate them uh, into value added. Um, yeah, I think that I'd like to add that, um, you know, being here uh, and, um, you know, hearing all these amazing stories that we've heard today um, makes me realize that, uh, you know, being part of a community like, like YSB, um, you know, it's very inspiring. And a lot of the things that we do, uh, Rod and I have always been very passionate about being able to, like, like you said at the beginning, improving the quality of life of people. Uh, and we were, we're just doing it, right? And, uh, and doing the best that we could, et cetera. But um, when we started onboarding with Yunus, we re realized that a lot of the things that we were already doing could be measured and could be improved upon. Uh, so, you know, that, that we had the potential to create more uh, social businesses around the business that was already working. So just an example, you know, the, the, the farmers that we work with uh, in our growth, um, you know, path, we realize that we will need more of them. So how can, how can we create more uh, agricultural businesses that can supply to us uh, in, a, in a proper way? Um, you know, the machines that we're building, we, we've, we've created a whole network of technicians, you know, just one of, it's a, it's a complex machine. So it's more than, than 100 businesses that are involved in the installation of one, one of those machines. So how can we sort of organize all, all of those networks uh, to create the, the, you know, the most potential uh, as possible. It's, and then the, the Colombian team has helped us a lot because, you know, working in, in any um, uh, development country, developing country is, is really difficult. And each country has particular difficulties, particular problems. Uh, and, you know, how, how you attack each of those, well, you know, you need a lot of help. So that's a, a big thank you to, to the team. Uh, also, um, we, we've talked a, a lot about the social side of things uh, in terms of environmental. Uh, we've, uh, we've disrupted uh, the industry by creating our own machines. But the second thing that uh, we're doing, and, 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 and Yunus is helping us a lot in, in understanding that effect, is that just the fact that we work from fresh fruit versus working from frozen. So the way all other facilities in Germany, in the United States, they, they have to bring fruit because they don't have fruit all year round, right? So they, they bring the fruit frozen. We work directly from fresh. That's, that's just not moving, transporting a lot of water around. And the re reduction in, in carbon fruit uh, footprint is, is immense. We're, we're learning how to measure that and communicate that. Uh, and, and, in, and in general, I believe it's just the network of collaboration that the, the potential that we have uh, that will really uh, help us become, you know, the, the, the leaders uh, in the industry that, that we want to become. Yeah. 
Great. Um, Paulo, you mentioned about the interaction with the team, uh, the, the support. So maybe a question to Gaia, <laughs> the type of um, portfolio support that we provide in, in Colombia and uh, how it's been working with the team, how is it with the social businesses? Okay. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and congratulations, Saskia um, and all the team. So um, just really quickly in, for those of you who don't know Colombia very well, it's, 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 a, it's a different in that it's a mid-sized or it's considered a mid-sized economy. Uh, um, and we are part of the OECD. OECD. Um, so the, the issue in Colombia was, you know, are there really a lot of, are there social and environmental problems to be addressed through social businesses? And that was kind of the question that was posed to us as a team when we started. Um, some years ago, and what and can we actually help them and service them, um, given the dynamics in Colombia? And so, when we have cases, we've proven that we are relevant um, with what we do and the capital that we provide, and also you know the non-financial support that we provide. In the case of Cero, um, and and that and that in fact Colombia is is more than you know the fame that it has outside in terms of you know drugs and violence, which which is still there. But there's definitely a thriving um, a, a business sector and even more so a, a social entrepreneurial um, sector like, like Cero. So when we started working with Cero, we decided to invest in them because they're being very humble. Um, their innovation is, is actually pretty much there, which for us was also important because, you know, agricultural sector, uh, we wanted to go a little bit further in the value add in, in the ag sector. Um, that was a strategic decision we made there and, and partnering with them, it was important because the innovation that they brought, um, that they bring to, to, the, to the process is, is important. They actually came up with, with, the, with the process themselves. It took us a while to understand what it meant, but we think we understand now. Um, so the innovation definitely was there and that was important for the sector. Um, kind of as a role model. Um, the social impact definitely there because of the farmers that they work with in the region where, where they operate mostly, which is it's a very hard hit region socially and violently. And, you know, it's the drug path and people export other things other than fruit. Um, so <laughs> it was important that <laughs> we could, we could, you know, we could show that, that there is a social impact and an alternative for, for, for farmers that is a, is, a, is, a, is a strong alternative, right? Um, and the third thing is the environmental impact, um, because again, the waste reduction, and, and they just mentioned it and they, they, they explained it briefly, but the overall package that Cero was bringing um, made our, our model, you know, it proved that we could, that we could support them that they are relevant and that um, they can be a role model. So how can we, how have we helped them? I think they have been, you know, and not only set up, but what we try to work with our portfolios, of course, provide the capital, which is important, but you know, the networking is, is, a, is a value, is a contribution. The imp well, you answered this question, actually, the impact measurement, the network, um, and the whole process uh, of the due diligence uh, and the standardization of their story and that helps them eventually to raise alternative funding uh, has also, I think, been helpful. Um, so we are now designing as we move along and we improve our, our non-financial support, other products and services that we can deliver to the entrepreneurs. Just uh, let me remind of a story that I'd like to share because it goes very well along with what you were saying. Um, so one of the farmers that we work with, you know, just like I was saying, yes, we're uh, in a region or in a country where there's a lot of people wanting to export other things and not fruit. And uh, that, that's been a problem for the farmers and, or the, the agriculture industry because there's a lot of people that just, you know, if you're growing coca leaves, uh, it's perceived as, as being uh, better, you know, then violence came and it's not only perceived, but they are forced to do it. Now, one of our, our farmers that grows pineapples, we went to visit him recently. Uh, in one of those visits, I asked, actually asked him, so why 
<laughs> this is really difficult what you're doing. Growing pineapples as growing any crop, it's, it's really difficult. And especially where he's doing it, where we lack infrastructure, where you know they have to carry the, the pineapples on mules or whatever. And they said, well, why do you do it? And he goes, well, you know what? If you do it properly, if you are conscious about what you're doing, he's actually organic certified. So not only just pineapples, he's organic certified pineapples. Uh, he's a, you know, we, we, we see him as a hero. And uh, so why do you do it? And he says, if you do it properly, if you're organized, if you have access to the funds, and if you have a company like yours that can buy consistently from us, it's actually better. It's a, financially is better. I get more money. Uh, my family has a better life. I don't have the risk of being involved in viol uh, violence, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a very specific uh, story that, you know, that shows the impact that this can have. Great, thank you. Now moving across the stage and uh, a few thousand kilometers away to the other part of, of the world into East Africa. Um, David is from Kenya, um, Kenya that I, I actually, up until two years ago, I called home myself and uh, lived and worked there for a number of years. So I got to travel around, I got to experience the, the lack of uh, access to infrastructure, the lack of access to energy. And um, that is what David's uh, company is addressing. So David, why don't you tell about uh, DG, how you got started, what is the, what is the story behind your, your enterprise? All right, thank you. Um, I think just to how we began is before founding uh, Viva Bits Green Energy, I used to work in a non for profit organization. And my key role was to develop a sustainable model that can make the NGO last even without funds. And while doing that, uh, we developed a simple model where we were working with the village people. And at that stage, we're calling them village uh, kind of like based advisors. Uh, the model was very successful. We did it for about uh, six years while I was there. And, you know, we were working with the farmers in rural areas. And what I observed is that most of these people would actually fail to buy seeds, certified seeds, you know, farm inputs, uh, fertilizers, all these things that they would buy kerosene, you know? I was, why is this very important, you know? And when you go to these rural communities, you realize that, um, as you mentioned, the lack of access to infrastructure, you know, these people cannot access energy, you know? And you need energy in the evening because of the children to study. Uh, you need energy, um, maybe lighting to do a little bit of uh, business in the evening or even house chores. Um, so I realized that this is a very important uh, problem, and it's big. Uh, at that time, I think we had about 80% of rural Kenyans who were off-grid. And I, and I thought about it. I'm like, wait a minute, there's something we can do different. Um, and I decided that, you know, I'll, I'm going to use my experience in terms of creating sustainable bottom-of-the-pyramid models that can do last my distribution. And that's why we developed uh, a similar concept that we call village solar entrepreneurs. Although it's changing to village social entrepreneurs because they are doing more good to these communities. And, and the reason why we opted that option is we could have gone to manufacturing. But you looked at, even back then, there were a lot of good companies that had quality solar products. But the biggest challenge was getting these products to the people who really need them and do it sustainably. Uh, for those who might be aware in the renewable energy space, uh, we have a lot of good companies that still struggle to actually uh, be profitable, trying to reach these uh, rural households. And you know, you know, we designed the concept and it was working even very early stage. And we've been scaling that uh, for the last six years. Uh, so what we are trying to address is that gap, uh, the energy access gap in these rural communities. And by doing that, uh, we're also creating jobs uh, to these rural communities uh, for the youth and women. Um, 
We began with that, you know, back in 2016, about 20 of them. And right now we have a team of 400 people. And these guys can actually earn, you know, uh, in an average of $30 in communities where the average is below $2, um, which is very sad. So, you know, we, we are changing that. So we are creating, we are kind of like killing two birds with one stone. So our model is uh, bringing um, energy access and it's creating jobs. And when you do this, the economic benefit that the energy savings that you know, they, you know they're actually buying a lot of kerosene. This one can now be invested in farm inputs, you know, to improve their livelihoods. And that is also leading also to a little bit of more improved uh, kind of like economic activities. And hopefully we fight poverty in that process. So that's that's our journey. Impressive. Great. So tell us about your your journey with us. Again, it's been a it's been a young relationship. You joined our portfolio relatively short period of time ago. So how has it been? What have you learned? What can we do differently? Good question. <laughs> um, it's a good question because I think how we came to meet uh, you know social business and um, they they were running a uh, an incubation program that we enrolled um, without even much expectations, actually. Uh, because why were we enrolling this program? Because we wanted to grow. We wanted to uh, become better. And in Kenya, uh, and I think globally, COVID has actually affected a lot of companies. And it was that period where um, in 2020, even with COVID, uh, we were actually a little bit lucky because we were busy trying to find how do we, uh, first of all, survive. Then we figured out how to thrive. So, uh, and during that period, we, you know, we kind of like developed a lot of partners that supported us along the journey. And we even got a little bit of uh, COVID relief funding. And that positioned us to growth. So we, we got a little bit of grants, a little bit of uh, debt, that was very expensive uh, because it was a risky time. Um, and, and during that period, you know, we were trying to figure out now, what are the next steps? Where do we get, you know, do we go from here? And, and the unions came by, you know, through this program. And, you know, first of all, they're supporting us with a program that ensures that we have, we understand our business model better. And we understand the gaps, we understand how do we position ourselves for growth. Um, that was very helpful. And, and then they mentioned that they might be having some funds to support social business. I'm like, we need that. We need that. I think I never wasted that opportunity. Uh, and because we really needed that, because we were, the loans that we could access at that time were really expensive. So we are talking about um, loans that were charging us about 13% on USD currency. That was very expensive um, because we, we get paid in Kenya shillings. So you can imagine the for, you know, foreign exchange losses. Um, and then, you know, most of these people wanted us to pay within two years or less. So what means is that uh, I mentioned, you know, I forgot to mention one thing about our business model is we also do financing for the customers. Uh, through what you call PSU for technology. So that means the customers don't, you know, don't pay us 100%. So they only pay like probably less than 10% upfront. And then they clear the balance of a period of about 12 to 18 months. So that means all our money is always outside. So when you have expensive short-term loans, almost kills you. Because you're actually collecting and paying uh, the loan. So... So we were like, you know, if we didn't get the support we got from UNOS, would probably I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, I'll probably be looking for something else to do because that, that would have been very expensive. Uh, kind of like um, thing for us, especially dealing with those kind of like of expensive loans. So when we we, we learned about the opportunity with UNOS uh, beyond the incubation and these funds. Um, and we heard about the terms, um, they were really good because we were talking about, I think at that time we were exploring about four years. Um, I think we got close to that. 
Um, and they were talking about a deal where you get in Kenya shillings. Where do you get that? It's unheard of, you know? And at a lower interest rate. Wow, we were like, this is what we need. At some point, I thought, like, can you buy the other guy's loans? You know, <laughs> I probably never said that, but, you know, in my mind, I, that's what I was thinking. Can we buy all these other loans? And so that we have enough time and enough uh, opportunity to actually support more people. And everything was really kind of like difficult because even due diligence was virtual because of COVID issues. We actually met with Susan uh, probably, you know, I think yeah, we met with you, I think just after the restrictions were lifted, uh, but that was like after almost, an, almost close to six months or so. Um, and, and we are very happy and we are hoping that um, we can grow together and we're also getting these kind of opportunities to also meet people and tell our story. So that's the other good thing. Uh, so I would say actually Yunus has been doing a lot of good stuff. Uh, one is finding the right social businesses to support. That's a very good thing. Um, I don't know what else you guys can do different because you're already doing so many good things. <laughs> Um, yeah. That was the right answer. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I promise I didn't plan that answer, but so go to, go to Susan. Um, I guess our experience working with uh, DG, again, it's one of the newer companies, and in general, the, the type of support that we offer in, in Kenya, it's a, it's a much smaller portfolio than, than Colombia. It's much... Um, less mature because it's younger portfolio. Um, and then it's again, the dynamics of the market is quite different. But uh, what type of uh, support we offer to social businesses? Um, first, I'll start with maybe DG and our experience with them and why we actually invested in them. Um, David is being very polite when he says he has these people and they sell. But a lot of the people who do last mile energy access, there are places they say they're not going to go to. It's expensive, it's inefficient, there's, there's nothing there. One of the reasons we invested in DG was he was willing to go where no one else was going, which means for him, he's not just a last mile distributor, he's a last, last mile distributor. So the bigger people stop here, he goes much farther. And then he does that with this army of 400 plus people, creating jobs for them as well, was a huge tick for us. When you mention Pago in Kenya, it's also, you know, it's very risky to do. There are businesses that say we, you pay us cash or we're not selling to you. He's been able to make sure he has a Pago model that works and his portfolio at risk is actually lower than all authorized commercial banks in Kenya. So he's actually doing it much better. So that's really why we invested in the business um, because they were going even where other social businesses were saying they can't go. Our work in Kenya with regard to support, as David said, begins even before we invest. We have an investment readiness program we are grateful to the iCare Foundation because that's actually how we've been able to run this program. And our vision when we established the program was, what do the social businesses actually need other than money? Because if you give them capital, it's really not enough. So we designed a program where our goal was to create stronger businesses. Whether it was YSB investing in them or not, um, that really was our goal. Because what we understood was, if this business is this businesses are stronger, then the impact that they have is more sustainable. And that's really why we are all here. We don't want to have this touch and go experience with our businesses. We want to know that the impact they are having is going to be there, whether YSB is an investor or not. And that's really where our contribution starts. So the businesses that we can invest in, thankfully, like DG, we invest in them. The others we pass on to peer investors because depending on the stage that the business is in. So that's really where our support starts before investment. Once we invest in businesses, we have both, um, can I say, support that is structured specifically for the business and support that's generic. 
for all of our portfolio companies, we have provided corporate governance training. And that has helped them to strengthen their internal systems on a day-to-day -day basis. For others, they were going now for additional funding rounds and that helped them significantly to do that. Our impact measurement process, which is what we do when we are onboarding the, co the companies has also been beneficial for them as well, because now they can measure their impact. And the way we do it is we also look at the customers that they are working with, um, that we want them to have impact for, be it their employees or the customers, are they really having the impact that they need to have? And that then feeds back to the businesses and the businesses now can have a more customer centric approach with regard to how they operate. And that also helps them going forward. And then from time to time, we get wonderful opportunities to do very specific work with businesses. I think brand manufacturing that Saskia mentioned was one company with which we have done very specific support. And part of that was actually documenting the effectiveness of the cook stoves that they have. Um, for the over 10 years that they have operated, for one of those cook stoves, nobody had ever done it. So you hear it's effective, but you don't have any paperwork to actually show that this is how effective it is. And that's what we did for band manufacturing. And that gives them more confidence with regard to going to the market to sell the product. It gives them more confidence when they now go for carbon credits for that specific product. And it also guides their research and development. So our support um, in Kenya is in three stages. Um, it's before, it's during, and the work that we try and leave behind is work that stays even if YSD stops being an investor in the company. Thanks, Susan. So again, it's a super passionate discussion. So we could continue into the into the night, but unfortunately, our time is finite. So I wanted to open up um, maybe a couple of questions that we can take and, and do it. Uh, with Sol and uh, Lorelei with uh, microphones, if anybody has any questions to the, to the entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm really impressed by these stories. Um, two questions really to the team from Colombia. How do we leverage these success stories um, across, I mean, what they're doing in Colombia in my view is potentially doable in other geographies. I'm thinking of my own country where we have a lot of local produce that is thrown out the window. And yet we have a story here whereby it's really being done in a very successful manner. So does Unis provide a platform where we can leapfrog and, and, and leverage some of these good stories without having to go through the hassles of really starting from zero? Is that something that you are looking at, you're doing, uh, or directly the people concerned? How can we borrow from that and, and, and maybe even make a local machine that probably would even be better than, the, than theirs? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, that's a, that's a very good question. And not just for this particular business, but in general, because they, there are similarities, you know, from country to country and business to business. And it is something that we are doing and uh, we're looking to do even better connecting like-minded and like type businesses together. So just to be a, a very concrete example, you know, about fruit drying, and we do have another business in, in Kenya that does similar or the different different technology, you know, it's, it's, it's air dry as opposed to freeze dry, but it's, again, it's the same industry, but it's a lot of learnings could be derived from one to the other. So we're looking to connect them. Actually, I already talked to the, the business owner in Kenya, so he's aware of uh, Cero. And uh, we were looking to create this platform where we can make it easier for, for entrepreneurs to connect to each other and, and share ideas and share experiences, learnings, visit each other perhaps. But that's something that um, we have in place, but we can, we can do better. So one more hand and then. Yeah, thank you for the amazing story. So I had a question on how do you how have you and Yunus found each other, both in Colombia and Kenya? How has that match been made? My answer to that is very easy. We have an investment readiness program. We sent out a campaign. Um, DG applied. 
I think the application came through up here investor. So that's also one of the ways we get a lot of these businesses. It's just an open campaign. Other times it's we talk to peer investors. That's how we found uh, DG and a lot of the companies that we that we invest in. So thanks for that question because that's what we spend, you know, most of our time doing uh, in Colombia. The, 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 this, there's this idea that the world is perfect in sourcing, in that you have incubators, then you have accelerators, and then you have you know investment readiness programs, and we all talk to each other, and the ecosystem works perfectly, and the entrepreneurs just flow in there, and everything works beautifully. That does not happen. Um, so the the sourcing is is actually a you know a one you know a network building and an ecosystem building initiative, which is super important that we haven't really talked here because we have focused on the entrepreneurs but um i think definitely part of what we are all doing in our respective countries is establishing or or participating to create that ecosystem of impact right which includes and i think somebody asked that question to professor yunus at some point at the beginning which includes you know other investors it includes definitely the, the social businesses um you know the public sector the academia because social businesses are all over the place but they don't they don't really follow that path that is in the books right that it's it doesn't so by establishing and being part of effectively a, an ecosystem um th that's where many of the entrepreneurs come from so other investors definitely some incubators and and accelerators word of mouth um government programs etc so we we are good at that um, we are, we're active players. And actually, the other thing that happens by working in an ecosystem is that, at least for us, we've learned how to very quickly change so that we can better service our social businesses, right? So we used to have an investment readiness program in Colombia, where we, um, together with BCG, which is a great partner for us in, in Colombia, and we're very thankful for what they've done with us there. Um, we had an investment readiness program, so we selected entrepreneurs in that readiness program that, that, that we prepared to, but we didn't invest in them. And then we realized that our portfolio of companies, we already have 12 companies in our portfolio, actually could significantly benefit from BCG consultants. Uh, and instead of you know, serving companies that were not part of our portfolio, why didn't we then transform that process um, and have them service our companies, our, our social businesses, the ones we invested in. So we, we changed the investment readiness program. Now we call, call it consulting for impact. And we have we, we work on a yearly basis with the companies in our with the social businesses in the portfolio. And we could not have figured that out if we hadn't been working, you know, for example, with BCG, who's also part of the ecosystem there, their social impact arm. Um, and we transformed ourselves. So it's a long way to answer your questions in terms of sourcing. Um, because it's definitely related to the ecosystem and the sourcing, uh, you know, comes from different parts, but then we also improve the sourcing and the servicing by working with that ecosystem and understanding the needs. And maybe just to add, um, we have a lot of misses when we work in the ecosystem. We look at very many transactions by the time it comes to investments. Like for DG, out of the cohort of 10, it's the only company we've invested in. So nine out of 10 are still out there getting support one way or another before they become investment ready. Great, thank you. So <laughs> respecting the schedule, uh, just parting words, and then really in one minute, if you can just just tell us your, your vision for the future, and then maybe some recommendations on, on uh, how to reach a world of, of three zeros. David. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's, an, that's an easy one. Easy. Oh, yeah. So, um, so our vision uh, for the next, uh, especially five years, uh, is to try and scale that growth. Um, so we are talking about currently reach 25,000 rural households. In the next five years, we are going uh, really ambitious to about 400,000 rural households. And that will actually reach about 2 million people, beneficiaries, because each house has about five people. Um, so that will contribute 
significantly in terms of uh, reducing the carbon emissions. Um, and, and we also create a lot of jobs. So we reduce a lot of unemployment and the amount of savings in these rural households will be very huge. Mm -hmm. And this will help in actually poverty eradication. So we'll feel that um, we'll play a small role in a big way into this uh, kind of like three zeros goal uh, going forward. And um, so we, we are try, trying to follow the footsteps of what uh, Yunus uh, believes in and uh, Yunus social business community. Um, and we want to actually to do it better. Um, and we have found that these communities have so many, so many uh, problems. So we are just, you know, just touching the surface and we want to go big, you know, um, and, and we want uh, a lot of this support and hopefully, you know, social business can find now more social businesses across the world uh, to support them so that each of us playing our small roles, we contribute to this big picture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, in, in our case, and when we're uh, often asked these kind of questions, my, my initial reaction is there is so much to be done. There is still so much to be done. I mean, Colombia was named one of the seven countries with the largest potential to become the like a, an agricultural uh, provider. Um, what we are doing is, is basically take up a very expensive process and developing a low cost model for it. So yes, we should be doing, you know, uh, massifying this model into other countries and taking advantage of, of, of those second grades in, in, in Africa and, and in any other country where there is access to produce year round, for example. Uh, so my quick question will be, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be done. <laughs> Can I add something? Um, I know the question wasn't directed to me, but I just wanted to say one thing. <laughs> Um, the, the, for, for at least for, 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 you know, I can speak for Colombia, that closing that gap or looking towards the future, you know, Saskia was mentioning that we work on two fronts on the corporate and, and with social businesses. Um, and actually in practice, that is, I believe, very, you know, very important for, for, for this actually to scale, right? So to the extent that we can work, and that's what we're trying to do in Colombia, to the extent we can work with the social business and the corporates together so that they're not in separate buckets, right? But that there's a, a, a virtuous cycle that is created there, then the impact is significantly larger. So, um, you know, it is hard. And of course, corporates take a little longer to, to make the transition. Um, but it, but we have a lot to learn from what is already happening in the you know other side of the world. Um, that that if we bring the, the the advantages that we do not have a lot of publicly traded I mean publicly traded companies which which is an advantage to the extent that you know high net worth individuals own private companies and big large corporations at least in Colombia and and if we can work with them together with the entrepreneurs and make change happen in terms of sourcing, in terms of working together, in terms of open innovation, open social innovation for these big corporations, having accelerator programs with these um, corporations locally that promote in terms social businesses, you know, and other things, then, you know, the loop closes and we can definitely improve um, and make a significant impact with a model that has been thought by YSB. Excellent, thank you. So let me just thank everyone. Thank you very much for making a long journey. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences. And thank you very much for all the work that you do for, for the social environment and then also for your, your communities in the countries where you are. Thank you. Saskia, back to the stage. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you very much, everyone. And we're nearing the end. Um, and I know my aim is still to get you all out of this room by six so we can finally have some drinks. So I'll be very, very brief. Um, so you've, you've heard we've come a long way as YSB in these last 10 years. So a lot has happened. A lot of concrete work has happened around the world. And 
for me personally, this was really the most impressive panel, seeing these amazing entrepreneurs and our fantastic, just two of the amazing country directors and Tom. Um, that was, it just gives me always the feeling that, that we're, we're on the right track because these are the right stories and, and this is what we need to do. So we've come a long way, um, but there's of course also um, quite a long way uh, to go. Um, and we have talked about the last decade, but we also wanna talk about the next decade. So how are we going to get to that world of three zeros and, and what's, what's the concrete path to, get, to go there? And I know it's a little bit of a platitude to always talk about partnerships and we have to do this together. But unfortunately, I have definitely learned over the last 10 years, we have to do it together and partnerships are important. Um, and that's why I am bringing this point up, even though everyone has heard this so many, uh, so many times. Um, and because of that, I'd actually like to make a couple of exciting announcements with some of the partners that have committed themselves together with us to actually build this next decade. And so I'd love to start getting you guys all on stage because I shouldn't be here on my own. So I'd, I'd love to get the folks from the Waste Foundation, from IKEA SE, you can already join me so I'm here not all on my own. Um, Tom, Saul from the team that are all working on this topic as well. Panya, please join me here um, for the work that you're gonna be doing and are already doing with us. Um, David, there he is, is already coming. Saul, you're still not here. You're also, you should also join us. How, who am I missing? Everyone that you know, that's obviously Frederick. Sorry, I'm completely, completely uh, missed you there for one second. Sorry about that. Um, and I'd also love to have Monica and the whole social procurement team coming up here as well. So we have everyone already here ready um, to make a couple of announcements. So I'll actually start with you, Panya. Tell us what you're going to do with us to help us achieve a world of three zeros. Yeah, thank you, Saskia. Um, uh, as an entrepreneur myself, I uh, learned how powerful it can be to start a business and how powerful it can be to solve a problem. So after my own founding uh, story, I realized that uh, using social businesses as a tool to um, eradicate some of the most pressing problems is the best way forward. So uh, my idea was to do what you do. Um, and uh, I wanted to create my own portfolio of social businesses. And as I uh, researched the topic, I realized that you do this already very fantastically. So I, um, <laughs> I said, let's cooperate and let's, 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 uh, let's create a partnership. And um, I'm very happy that um, there is a new model coming up. Is there a slide for it? Or? Oh, all right. Um, yeah, um, there is a new model coming up, which uh, you called the um, Impact Investing Services, which allows me to build my own uh, social business portfolio while um, relying on all the wonderful work you created in the last 10 years um, with um, building a fabulous team. I met a lot of them. I'm glad I was on a field trip to meet the local teams as well. Um, and uh, it allows me to build my own portfolio with your help and um, I can learn from you and I can learn, uh, I, I don't have to go through all the pain that you probably went through in the last 10 years. And I start from a much higher um, um, platform. So I'm, I'm really happy that we do this together starting this year, probably. Yes, yes. yes. starting this year. And um, yeah, it's, it just allows me to, uh, just, just one more thing, if I may. Um, I mean, I was fortunate that um, my own founding story left me with um, a lot of opportunities, but um, as uh, it was said before, um, wealth shouldn't be in one singular hand and it should be redistributed. So um, I think it's also a good way of moving um, money into where impact is, which is what, what we should all strive for. And if I look at the three zeros, um, if you ask me what I want in the next 10 years, I don't think we'll achieve three zeros globally yet. But if I take these three zeros and then add them at the end of each of your impact so far, um, that would be a cool goal. And maybe I can be a part of it um, in the next 10 years. Thank you. 
Amazing, Panya. And obviously, Panya is totally humble. He's like an incredible founder himself, unicorn and so on. I don't need to get into that. And we're so delighted to work with you. And have also, we just were together, obviously, in Uganda and Kenya uh, two weeks ago. So you actually saw all of this in action as well. So thanks so much, Panya. And we're really excited to be with you on this path. Um, Tom, I'll um, hand over to you to introduce this next very exciting initiative, which hopefully will come up on screen because I lost the clicker in the process. But Tom, I'll hand over to you to introduce. Yes, so the next uh, initiative that we are, we have started actually, is um, focusing on wash and waste sectors, waste uh, related and wash sanitation health related sectors in India and uh, East Africa. And that is a collaboration with our, our partners, uh, strategic partners, the Waste Foundation from the Netherlands, and the funding partners, uh, Swiss, uh, Swedish uh, Development Agency, CEDA. Ah, close, close. <laughs> and uh, upcoming, I can, I can announce a new partnership also. That, a new uh, partner that just joined the IKEA SE uh, from, from Sweden also. As, as a funding partner into the collaboration. So super excited. Again, it's, it's something that we will focus on uh, in India, East Africa, Kenya, and Uganda, where we are. And um, it's again, social businesses that related to the wash and, and waste sectors. Well, I'll hand over to Han, the CEO of the Waste Foundation to share a couple of them. Okay, thank you. Well, you're going to achieve the three girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going to help. We're going to help. Uh, thank you so much. Well, um, Professor Yulu showed us uh, over years already, you know, that the poor are bankable. And with that in mind, I, I was also so grateful that he mentioned actually that uh, investments, small investments and loans and savings into toilet systems can already make a big difference for people, especially the poor. So based on that experience that we also have as Waste Foundation, uh, we started the program, uh, which is called Take a Stake, Take a Stake Fund, um, which brings uh, just one level higher, smaller entrepreneurs, sometimes social entrepreneurs who have made a business out of waste, sanitation, water systems, and uh, bring some of these into a circular economy. And um, although the poor are bankable, uh, not, the banks are not always yet uh, convinced that this is a really good business case for them. So uh, we, uh, from our side, we, uh, we helped them to, in, in the technical part of it, we uh, also identified a quite a big pipeline of good potentials. Um, and we are so happy that we have found a great partnership now with Yulus, because we are really convinced that in partnership, we work best, uh, where Yulus can bring its, uh, its skills on fund management and social entrepreneurship. And uh, with the help of the launching partner, SIDA, we have indeed already started and we have now uh, yeah, uh, are welcoming uh, new partners uh, to this uh, enterprise uh, very soon. So very much looking forward to the next stage. Shall I just uh, pass it on to you, um, Orsa? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Han. <laughs> yes, I'm Orsa from IKEA Social Entrepreneurship and I'm here with my colleague Jens. And we work in the intersection between philanthropy and business and support social enterprises around the world in many different areas. And we have a particular focus on improving livelihoods for people who are vulnerable or far away from the labor market. So very much in line with the three zeros. And so we are very happy to announce here today that we are joining the consortium and that we are uh, in five minutes, I think, going to sign the grant agreement. <laughs> and, and you could ask yourself, so why would IKEA Social Entrepreneurship do this? Uh, well, there are very many reasons. One is, of course, that we had a very social purpose already when IKEA was founded and we have had it ever since, and which is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And that, of course, translates into different versions every decade, depending on what the world looks like. And now we're aiming to become circular by 2030. And a big part of that is, of course, to work with renewable or recycled materials. And then the waste sector is, of course, very important. 
and uh, we need to get away from all the mismanaged waste and the very harsh conditions for the informal waste workers. So that is why we are joining and our grant goes to the waste sector in India. And we're so much looking forward to learn and to contribute to a more holistic uh, transformation and some scalable models. We're on it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Asa. Frederick, from anything you wanted to add? Well, Frederick is from CEDA, obviously, and we're really grateful that you're part of this as well. So big, big thank you. And I'm really excited about this because this is a massive opportunity. It's massive need. And this is really something we can scale up together. So thanks so much for the partnership. Um, the third thing that uh, we wanted to bring up um, as another more thematic focus is something that I will hand over to David to our head of investor relations and new product. So David. <laughs> thank you. Here. Thank you, Saskia. So um, yeah, that's yet another uh, exciting initiative that we want to announce today. So we actually see a tremendous opportunity in building a world of three zeros by investing into sustainable food value chains across the world. So if we look at the food value chains today, we see that on the one hand, we have a very fragile value chain, which globalization has made very, uh, very fragile. We see that now, sadly, with the war that is going on in Ukraine, which is spanning also into Africa uh, in terms of food insecurity. Um, climate change has made them very fragile also, uh, another threat to food security. At the same time, we see that socially and econo economically, these value chains are unfair, with a very unequal distribution of the value uh, that is created along that value chain. And lastly, also ecologically, we're looking at the value chain, which is accounting for 30% of the global CO2 emissions. We're talking about soil degradation, and we're talking about, about biodiversity loss. So at the, at the same time, if we look at, um, at what social businesses are out there, we have seen that for each and every of these issues, we have found heroes like Zero <laughs> and others that can solve each and every of these challenges. So then to, say, to, to take uh, back Professor Yunus' words, let's do it now. Um, in, in that sense, let's build that bridge between the problem and the solution. And this is why we're super excited to, say, to, to announce that we will um, make accessible to the investors a product where they can contribute over the next years in building that world of three zeros with a sustainable food value chain. So we are going to invest, you see, uh, quite some money uh, in, in that value chain, and we'll work with a lot of heroes like we have seen today to make this happen. Great. Thanks very much, David. So there's a lot of work to do. So if anyone's interested in that, talk to David. Um, and with that, I want to go to our last announcement and want to hand over to Monica, who will tell us some exciting stuff on the social procurement side. Go ahead. Yeah, you heard it a lot today already, uh, social procurement, and that is because we really believe in this massive opportunity. Um, last week at Davos, we pre-released the study that we've been talking about um, that we did together with BCG. So Alex is here today from BCG. So a, a big thank you to you and your colleagues uh, for cooperating with us on that as well. Um, and that study shows that it's a massive um, 5 billion opportunity to create impact within the corporate value chain in the next 10 years. Um, and to us, basically, it's a no-brainer. Corporation can just keep on buying the stuff and the services they do anyways, and just create impact along the way. So we really believe in that. Um, I'm here with our head of unusual partners, uh, Lucy. That's uh, our program where we actually empower corporate procurement leaders and procurement managers. And we have educational programs around that. And we are active in that space here in Europe, but also in Brazil. Um, Tulio is here from our Brazilian uh, office, head of corporates there. Um, so we really uh, have a global approach on that. We also um, empower the social businesses to become corporate ready. So help them with non-financial support. We heard a lot about that um, on our last panel. Um, in terms of quality and in terms of quantity um, so that really both sides um, can learn um, and then can 
um, work together with each other. We also help um, our corporate partners to find, uh, to map and to uh, find the social businesses that fit their needs. Um, and we're very honored uh, to actually announce uh, new partnerships and also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to, uh, and with that, I really ask our corporate partners who are active with us in that space, um, please, could you squeeze over a little bit to make some more space for those corporate change makers? Uh, yes, please. Uh, we have Julian and Alois from Audi here with us today. We have Jamie from Zurich with us here today. So, yeah, so we are really excited um, that we will be working together in building partnerships and in building impact with social procurement in the next few years. Um, so what's your perspective on um, working towards the three zeros in the next decade with social procurement? Thank you very much. Well, I think first of all, congratulations on these 10 years. I think that we have heard so many inspiring stories and uh, where we feel really honored to, to celebrate this uh, yeah, occasion with you. Now, Audi is, um, <clears throat> part of a very um, transformative or a, a part of an industry that is in a big transformation right now. Um, we at the procurement department, we are committed to um, also transforming our supply chain uh, to become um, yeah, more sustainable. And uh, for that, we, we have a variety of um, programs and initiatives. Um, they focus on or two key factors that they um, next to others focus on are fairness and um, diversity. And interestingly, diversity for us is also a factor that we believe um, holds a, a very big potential for future innovations. Um, so we are very excited um, yeah, to, uh, to, to include more unusual partners in our supply chain in the future and uh, very happy to do that together with you. Yeah, so likewise, um, it was a pleasure to spend the day here with you. Um, we had a meeting just before the event today because um, one of the things that um, Zurich and um, YSB is, are discussing is that how can we go to Latin America with our program? So the program that we have that we call internally social procurement um, is part of our wider sustainability or sustainable sourcing initiative. It's addressing the, the S of the ESG. Um, and we started about five years ago. We are one of the founding members of the um, Buy Social Corporate Challenge that we, we heard of um, earlier today as well. And we know the impact that just by directing part of our spend to social enterprises can create. This is not about spending more or compromising on quality. We know that from the example that we have from the UK, we are now expanding our program to Germany, to Ireland, and we want to do more. So that's the idea to, to go to Latin America next. And I think that um, the conversations here, the presentations, the, the whole panels, it was so inspiring for me today. I, I usually attend a completely different type of <laughs> event. You know, I was here in Berlin um, two or three weeks ago in a very traditional procurement conference. 1.5 thousand people, completely different atmosphere. I was thrilled just about the session before we entered this room. It, it was amazing, um, really. So thank you um, for this. And um, I would like to give a big shout out to all of you here, especially the social enterprise, because what we are doing is nothing more that we should be doing is directly directing just a little bit of our spend to you guys, but you are for us, the real heroes. You are those guys out there making the social impact that we want to help you doing this. Thank you. We also heard from Saskia before about the partnerships and yes, I'm gonna say it again. Uh, we are building this program and this whole space of social procurement together with amazing partners some of whom are here today. So um, we took it from Euclid. Um, thank you for being with us here today and for being with us in creating that program. We also work with, we also work with Agora, with the uh, World Economics Forum. 
I always uh, mispronounce it, World Economic Forums, Global Alliance for Social Entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, Francois, who's heading that, couldn't join today. He got COVID as well, but he's with us here today in spirit. Um, yeah, uh, happened last week at Davos. <laughs> Um, we also work with Moving Worlds and with Catalyst 2030, and we also work with Send Germany. Um, Michael and Flavia, who were here, are currently not in the room. Well, a big thank you and a round of applause to all of our partners uh, for social procurement. And last but not least, we are also walking the talk. Um, so we also work on social procurement for our own office um, and for the event today. So the cakes that you had during the break, for example, our team, our amazing internal services team worked hard to really do all the procurement um, for today from Berlin-based um, social businesses. Um, so you're experiencing social procurement live here today and we, really want to create, uh, we really want to um, do only social procurement. So that's one of our internal goals for hopefully not the next 10 years. Hopefully we're going to get there a little bit sooner. Um, but we are really uh, trying to walk the talk and obviously we encourage everybody um, to also do that. And with that, I, I'm giving it back to Saskia. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I promised to get out at six, now it's five past. So I think this is now the, the really the final words. Um, I think, again, you've all seen it, fantastic partners going forward. Um, I always say that YSB is my baby. Um, and um, now I also have my own other baby since three and a half years, by the way, since that you may have been screaming and seeing around here. Um, but I wanna say that YSB is not just my baby, but it's all of your babies. So you're all now officially co-parents of YSB <laughs> and the social business movement. Um, and with that, I would just like to say, thank you so much. Let all of you guys go down and hand over to the very final person making an announcement, which is Tulio, the awesome uh, director of our corporate part in Brazil. Tulio, please come here and thank you so much again for everyone here. <laughs> Thank you. Just two more hours uh, of, of a known Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so three uh, easy uh, information for you. So now, since it's a celebration, now it's time for a beer. And uh, for having this network with... Uh, uh with among you guys you must have received uh this here at the beginning if not someone will give you at the end there anna i want everyone to put and make it visible so our idea is to make it a little bit funnier uh, our network uh, outside so connect to someone that has the same uh the same zero that you discuss talk informally we don't want you to go that too formal but ideas what you're seeing in your communities in your family regarding in the world regarding the theme so we can connect and 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 create uh like ideas for the people who are at home uh, watching us on zoom also it's a moment for network so if you want to continue on the i don't know where should, where should i look to for them to see me but keep continue at the zoom calling so uh, we're gonna have break uh, breakout rooms and the third is there's a book called the word of three zeros we're gonna have an autograph so if you are interested look for a table where the photo was was taken so we can have your own book. And that's it. I didn't, I don't forget anything. This is flowers. I forgot, something, Yo, I forgot something. I'm hogging the mic. I'm so sorry. Before you go into that dreaming mode of doing what uh, Tulio just told you, I totally forgot to say thank you to two very special people. Flora sitting here in the first row. Please come on stage. And Lisa, Flora and Lisa. I don't know where Lisa is. You two, the two of you have been working literally day and night for the last couple of weeks and months, and and I 
No, but I just, I wanted to say thank you because like, you guys have been putting this all together. Yeah, I know the whole team is doing amazing work every day, but you guys have been, for this particular event, have just been working day and night. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the whole team. So one for you, Flora, thank you so much. And one for you, Lisa, as well. Thank you so much. Basically, just to translate Saskia's words, if there are any complaints or anything to say, I'm the one to blame, so <laughs> don't be shy. I think everyone seemed pretty happy. I mean, we just heard the feedback that this was quite an inspiring event compared to all the social procurement events he's been to before. So I think that you got a thumbs up. So guys, it's time to drink, it's time to dream and to have fun together. Let's celebrate. Thank you.